Good evening. Again, uh, really apologize for a little bit of the delay. I just got a call from our district governor, Asha Prasanna Kumar, who is one of the, uh, the inaugural speakers. She says Google Maps tells her she's exactly two minutes away from the campus, but she's sitting behind a lot of traffic. So uh, she'll get here as soon as possible. I really apologize again. If you could just bear with us, please, for another couple of minutes, we'll get this thing started. Maybe what I can do is, um, in the interest of time and getting us a little further ahead on the agenda, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items since many of you are here early. Uh, when you registered, each of you got a cloth bag, right? So that's it in, in, in with you. Can you answer this? Now, in each of your cloth bags, there is a conclave uh, folder that looks like this. So if you just take a minute, please, to look at that. And when you open the folder on the left pocket, there is a booklet which looks like this. The inside cover of the booklet has the agenda, broad agenda, for today's uh, conclave, followed by a list of speakers, panelists, and as you turn into the booklet, you'll find fairly detailed profiles of each of our speakers and panelists today. The reason I say this uh, is because while I will be introducing as the MC the speakers and the panelists, I'm going to keep it really, really brief. So if you want to know more about them, we have a more exhaustive profile that's included here. Towards the back of the booklet are the three collaborators on this uh, interesting first of its kind trailblazer conclave, which is my own club, Rotary Bangalore Downtown, uh, with Rotary District 3190, of which we are a club. Uh, and of course, our host today, I am Bangalore Alumni Association. So you'll see all of their logos. And of course, an event like this is difficult to pull off without sponsors. And we have three associate sponsors. And at the back of the booklet, you'll see that we have Audi, which is our main sponsor for today. And you've been seeing uh, the videos there. The other document you'll find, again, in the, in the left pocket, are five of these cards. We call them the Q cards. And uh, the reason for this is, as you listen to the speakers, who are going to come uh, one at a time and talk to you for approximately 18 minutes, you will have a chance to ask a question. We suggest that you please write it down on this card uh, during, this, during the talk. At the end of every speaker session, we will have volunteers who will patrol the aisles and collect these cards from you. So again, to make it efficient, once you fill the card, if you could kindly pass it down your row to the person sitting closest to the aisle, it will facilitate a quick collection of these cards. And as the other speakers are talking, we will have these, uh, the questions curated and be able to present to you, uh, present to the moderator a set of questions that will be posed to the speakers. So that's, the, that's going to be the flow. Uh, the panelists themselves will, will of course, uh, be moderated by um, uh, the head of the alumni relations. Uh, Mr. Parth Sarthi will be doing that. And the speaker panel will be moderated by my colleague, Rotarian Satish Madhavan. So that is, that actually takes us about two minutes into what I would have covered a little later. Um, the first order of business in, a, in a, any meeting of this kind is to the lighting of the lamp, the beautiful lamp that we have here. So we're just waiting for another couple of minutes, please, to have our district governor get here, and uh, she will assist us along with other dignitaries to light the lamp. Um, one thing I must point out uh, is that we have in our midst a senior Rotarian who, as it turns out, was on the very first board of governors of this very institution, IAM Bangalore. And that's none other than our past Rotary International Director, Dr. Manjunath Sethi. Padrik Sethi, sir. There I go. Sorry, sir. I think I just promoted uh, 
Manju <laughs> to the Rotary International Director. Sorry, Pant. So, um, so that was a little tidbit I thought I just picked up uh, earlier this uh, this evening. So um, we are still a couple of minutes away. Are there any burning questions that any of you have? One other uh, maybe housekeeping item. Uh, we have a packed agenda. We haven't really allowed for a lot of downtime between the speaker and the panelists. So what, in case you wish to take a bio break, we request that you just wait for a transition point uh, in deference to the speakers. And uh, the restrooms are across the hall uh, to my right. The, the exit door is there. So kindly exit through that door and you can come back uh, there. So that's, uh, you know, so we, we haven't really planned for any um, bio break. And of course, uh, the, the last item is we request you all to kindly put your mobile phones uh, on a silent mode. And I think I'm going to do mine as well. So, yeah, you've done that. All right. Thank you. We had an online registration system in place. I think many of you, most of you, uh, did go in there and register online. Um, believe it or not, the capacity of this hall is approximately 328 seats, I'm told. So we had a total registration as of this morning of 298. So we were almost completely fully registered. But obviously, with uh, with the traffic issues and uh, and, and, and even the weather is cooperated, we are having a little bit of a problem. People being here on time. Is she here? Okay. All right. Okay. So we uh, we are going to get started. Um, so if I might please request uh, Director IMB Professor Raghuram, please, to come up. PRID Shaker Mehta. Please. PRID Pandurang Shetty. PDG Madhura. And Mr. Sanjay Kothari, please. I now would like to request the president of Rotary Bangalore Downtown, the host club, to please welcome the audience. It's a pleasure and privilege to be here today, especially being the alumnus from IM Bangalore. And I hope uh, there are many more IM alumni here, Bangalore alumni here. Yeah, thanks for coming. Good afternoon to all the dignitaries and uh, esteemed participants. Before I start, I just wanted to announce uh, that unfortunately the chief guest of today, the Special Secretary Rina Ray, was, is unable to make it today because yesterday night there was a call from the Prime Minister's office and they are holding a special meeting today and she had to attend. So she could not refuse that. So we will be missing her. She actually planned to send one of the directors from Ministry of HRD. Um, but uh, I was just waiting for that information that, that did not come through. But she sends her greetings and good wishes for this program. A warm welcome to the professor, 
प्रोग्राम डायरेक्टर ऑफ इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मैनेजमेंट आई वॉन्ट टू सी वेज द प्रोफेसर एंड वॉम वेलकम टू अवर डिस्ट्रिक्ट गवर्नर आशा कुमार आशा प्रसन्न कुमार बट आई थिंक शी इज ऑन द वे नाउ एंड वाइस गवर्नर प्रसन्न कुमार बोथ ऑफ दैम और कमिंग वॉम वेलकम टू द डीन्स ऑफ द इंस्टीट्यूट एंड वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल दीकर्स एंड पैनलिस्ट हुआ कम टूडे थैंक्स फॉर कमिंग वॉम वेलकम टू अवर मिस्टर पातसादी head of uh, almer relations and to all our uh, district officials from rotary rotarians friends and almer members a warm welcome to you all at the outset i would like to thank uh, iim for having readily agreed to join with the rotary and uh, conduct this rail blazer conclave focusing on education i uh, before i start i just i i all of you know about iim bangalore so i am not going to talk about iim just wanted to say that rotary international is a global ngo um it is started in chicago 112 years ago it connects about 1.2 million members across 200 countries and their main focus is on uh, tackling humanitarian problems and uh, sustaining communities one of the main uh, if anybody talks about rotary the um, the main thing the main key uh, initiative that rotary has taken all over the world is polio eradication uh, from the time of it started in 1988 it has spent over 1.7 billion dollars and millions of voluntary hours in this initiative and it is proud to say that today the world is literally polio free except for two countries afghanistan and nigeria <coughs> the today's topic the education sustaining education is one of the six focus areas of rotary uh, rotary international and uh, statistics say that 775 million uh, adults over the age of 15 years are illiterate across the globe which comprises of 17% of the world population coming to india uh, the main concerns are that 6.5 million children are ready to go to school and then we have 17% drop out from schools especially in the secondary schools before they reach 10th standard we find uh, people dropping off and the other thing which is happening in schools especially government schools is there is absenteeism of 25% rotary's response in india is the rotary india literacy mission which focuses on quality education and total literacy and we here we have today our chairman our Ro rotary india literacy mission mr shekham mehta would be talking more about it so today conclave is we are going to look at explore new ideas in the areas of education and very happy to say that we have esteemed leaders here who would share the knowledge experience and their new initiatives of scaling and sustaining solutions uh, unfortunately we are not having the uh, uh, people from the ministry i thought we would hear the government's point of view today i think we missed that um but today the objective is to see uh that we look into the insights of uh, finding solutions in education sphere both individually and as an organization and see if we can implement the greenfield ideas the other objective of today is to see at the end of the day if you can draft a, a action paper on improving education which we could try to influence government's education policies so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and i now welcome our professor raghuram to address the audience thank you hi good afternoon to all of you 
and welcome to this uh, beautiful verdant campus at uh, IIM Bangalore. Uh, the weather is kind of highlighting the campus uh, even more. So, well, thanks for uh, coming here and uh, thanks to Rotary for partnering with the IIM ABC alumni is what it says. So I'm going to show of hands. I know you asked for the IIM B alums. I am A alums. Yes, sir. <laughs> There's Pramod. I saw. Right. Okay. And uh, yeah, there are. And I am C alums. Okay. Well, they mark their presence by not being here, I guess. So, anyway. Well, I'm glad at least uh, partnerships are working, and I think that's the uh, way to go. Uh, so, um, I think when some time ago uh, they came and said we're going to do this event and, uh, you know, given Rotary's objectives, uh, pick up some theme and sort of drive, uh, drive it in a way where some impact can be made, you know, maybe policy impact. Um, so, I think education, of course, uh, very critical. And uh, in that, I think the focus, if I gather today, is... Uh, K-12 or, you know, basically the school, school part, you know, otherwise it would be good for us also to get a sense, higher education and all that, but anyway, at the school part. So I remember a conversation with uh, Mr. Jabdekar where uh, I think he very clearly said that uh, I think over a few decades now, India has in many ways uh, dealt with the problem of uh, capacity in terms of numbers, you know, in terms of reaching out, in terms of numbers, and I think in many ways the enrollment ratios uh, in schools speak for it. You know, we are clearly in the high 90s and, uh, um, you know, at least at the primary, maybe uh, higher primary, uh, there's some dropout. Uh, but the concern was of quality. And I think are we giving the, uh, you know, are they really getting the kind of education that uh, the school and whatever infrastructure and getting the children into that whatever is called the school, you know, are they getting what they uh, need to be getting? And I think that's the big concern. So that's really, I would say, first issue is to how do we address quality? And of course, quality, I think broadly, I would look at it two ways. You know, one is uh, content. And the other is the, the engagement, uh, because at this uh, levels, I mean, well, I think even in higher education, I think the engagement with somebody called a faculty or, you know, who facilitates the learning process is very important. Uh, of course, content in, I, I see a lot of work going on, uh, you know, tele-education or, uh, you know, downloads from Wi-Fi and, uh, enabling teachers to draw content, latest content. Um, and given how the internet is uh, sort of penetrating, I think access to content is, you know, can be made, there is enough technology and I see many organizations sort of working in that. Um, the, I think the other issue to me is extremely important and that is do we have the uh, kind of faculty, the teachers, who can either through this content or whatever other content engage with the students in a meaningful way that uh, gets them to, you know, learn. And I think that's probably where within quality uh, a greater attention is today called for. Uh, you know, it could be, our, do we have high quality teachers? Are the teachers willing to go and be in those kind of places where uh, a lot of especially rural, remote areas where, you know, the children are present. Yeah, there are, of course, uh, many attendant um, mechanisms that have uh, come in, and I think they need constant review. Uh, so one issue is, of course, government schools versus private schools. And again, enrollment ratios are very clear. Government school enrollment is going down. 
private school enrollment is going up. Uh, the total enrollment, of course, is going up. So, you know, something private schools are doing, you know, in spite of the fact that they charge more. So, you know, there is, in, uh, there is also that willingness to pay for, uh, you know, people realize, parents are realizing wherever that they'd like to see their children go to school and uh, get some quality education. Of course, one important facilitating mechanism in government schools that brought the uh, attendance and uh, in some sense also the learning was the midday, the midday meal scheme. And I think that's played a very significant role uh, to, you know, and in fact, a lot of studies go to show that uh, it has also had a, a higher impact on the girl child because many times, you know, parents want the girl child to be at home to help in the cooking or, um, you know, uh, if, if the girl child has to eat, then it, you know, they better cook. So in the school, I think the midday meal in many ways has uh, had a big impact uh, and it is uh, growing, uh, more, more efficient ways of doing it. Um, of course, the right to education. I guess is another uh, element where probably one is awareness itself, you know, has it been fully leveraged and I know there are many organizations that work in just uh, creating that awareness. So that, uh, that's important. But even then I've seen many schools that the, you know, right to education at a fee level works but then there are many expenses in schools that go beyond fee. And then many schools, uh, you know, they're not sure how to deal with it. They see, and that, that does create discrimination. It could be a simple thing like going on a school picnic and there is a charge for it. And, you know, then the poorer ones are, you know, their parents are not in a position to afford that. So how do you get that equity on, uh, you, know, you know, given the original spirit that you want all the children to have sort of equal opportunities, equal access, uh, are we really achieving that? Uh, I would say another is uh, marginal segments. So there are many, many types of marginal segments and uh, have we reached a stage where uh, we are able to provide that uh, customization that is required for marginal segments, uh, you know, starting from just uh, physically challenged and then moving on to, you know, those who are uh, mentally challenged. Uh, there are uh, interesting segments like, uh, you know, my good friend Pramod is here, uh, runaway children from, uh, you know, who run away from home and then they are sort of in some sense brought in and there is a period before they are go back home or you know how do we address their schooling needs and how can schooling sort of make them uh, more connected with uh, society with their community or their family and so on uh, i think so there could be different sort of attributes of uh, uh, segments that need uh, specific attention. So, of course, all this calls for, you know, the, I think in many ways the core of this is the teacher segment and are we providing the right kind of uh, uh, teaching skills, as it were, uh, with that sensitivity that's required and, of course, the kind of salaries that may be required to make people want to be in this profession. So, I, I see these as important issues and uh, I, I'm sure there are many more, a lot of you are more connected, engaged uh, in this uh, aspect of education than I am. Just want to leave you with the four-way test of Rotary, you know, and it's a nice set of questions for us to ask whatever we do. Uh, is it the truth? So. You know, is school education uh, in some ways, uh, you know, is it the truth, whatever we are doing about it? And that activity itself 
in terms of you know building good societies uh, is it fair to all concerned mm -hmm. so will it build goodwill and better friendship and uh, will it be beneficial to all concerned i guess with these four questions you know whatever initiatives proposals in this very important domain i'm sure we'll sort of make progress that would be helpful thank you dr agram you you stole every rotarian's heart when you recited the four way test i must say thank you um so we're going to get started we're going to make some slight adjustments to the agenda again because we have our other distinguished uh, inaugural speaker uh, who's not made it yet so we're going to get right into uh, the speaker series right now as i mentioned your booklets have exhaustive profiles of the speakers so i'm going to keep the introduction of these speakers very brief arguably past rotary international director shaker matha his philanthropic activities far overwhelm his corporate successes he's achieved the pinnacle of positions of leadership within rotary as a rotary international director gone on to chair the rotary foundation in india and is now the chair of rotary india literacy mission his work in disaster relief particularly after the tsunami of 2004 is as we say in rotary is part of rotary folklore to say more about him would be to stand between him and you so let me at this point just say welcome he is coming to us all the way from calcutta arrived this morning uh, so with a warm round of applause sir we welcome you to come and give us your talk good afternoon everyone uh greetings from rotary to everyone here and it's a pleasure absolutely coming to i am bangalore this is the first time i've been to calcutta many a times but never to i am bangalore i am going to tell you about what the initiatives rotary has taken up after the eradication of polio which was a big deal actually uh considering that 30 years back somebody had the courage to get up in philippines at a convention and say that we will eradicate polio from the face of earth now in mankind's history we have just eradicated one other vaccine preventable disease and that's smallpox for for an ngo to get up and that to 30 years back and say we'll eradicate another disease a lot of people sniggered at that gentleman but today we are proud of it that he had the courage to do that buoyed by that success in india polio got eradicated in 2011 bored by the success we said okay let's get on to something else and uh, after a huge discussion we came to literacy so total literacy and quality education is what we've taken up but little did we realize what we have chewed into in polio we were given a vaccine by who and told any child up to 5 years give the vaccine on certain days and thereafter of course many other things followed but here there is no who to give us a vaccine if at all there is a vaccine it changes every 200 kilometers because the language changes and the board curriculum changes so it's been a tough thing but i'm happy to say in just 3 years we've made reasonable i would say a little more than reasonable progress and that's what i'm going to share with you uh, after initially i was given the responsibility of chairing this program i had no clue Uh, how to tackle it so for first 6 months we just had some think tank meetings meeting uh, people like you uh, the intelligentsia we met uh, everybody in shastri bhavan uh, right from the minister to secretary under secretary joint secretary we met people who wrote the right to education act and ultimately we came up with an acronym called teach and teach stands for uh, teacher support e learning adult literacy child development and happy school the idea was to have a totally comprehensive program so in any education program you would have a child a teacher and the school we were looking only up to class 10 or class 12 uh, if the foundation was strong the rest uh, people like dr aguram uh, will definitely be able to take care of people who are outstanding and who come to great institutions like this 
let me now get into each of these. What is it that we have been able to achieve? And this is just, I would say, till now we were taxiing. We are now at a stage of a takeoff after about two and a half to three years' time. Uh, under teacher support, uh, teacher training is the main thing that we do. And we don't do it ourselves. We have partner agencies who are some of the best in India. Uh, British Council is one of them. Macmillan is another one. Uh, Learning Links is another one. And <coughs> sorry. And there are many others. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, 32,487 teachers trained. And this is just one example, headmaster of a, a school, a government school in West Bengal. He attended one of the sessions in Calcutta and that was conducted by Macmillan and this was his comment thereafter. Several mental health issues that might exist in our students and how to deal with such situations. He wasn't aware of it. And similarly, there are so many other interventions. People are getting to think a little differently. The teachers are understanding how to handle uh, classrooms better, how to deal with uh, students better, how to get the best out of the teachers. Right now, we are about to start a program with the Chhattisgarh government where we're going to teach, we're going to train 3,000 cluster coordinators who in turn are going to do the cascade model where they will go to every school about 15 to 20 under each of them and then train about 1 lakh 30 thousand student uh, teachers in one state and the pradesh government has expressed interest to do a similar thing and the same is with the punjab government we are in talks with alan gemel and uh, usha prashar for of british council for a similar program in jharkhand uh, so that's what we are doing under teacher training and you can see this happens. One good thing about Rotary is it's far reach. Any program, I was told a lot of times, do a pilot. But for Rotary, pilot is all of India because there are 37 districts. Each of the districts want to do the same thing that we are doing at any one place. So reaching out to all of India is very easy. So if this was happening in Pune, uh, this is happening here in Karnataka, uh, this is happening in Maharashtra, and these are just sample pictures that I am showing you. Another thing that we do, this was a concept given to us by one of the people who wrote the Right to Education Act. She said, why don't you have a naming and shaming website? We left the shaming part because that's not our role. We took the naming part, we thought it's a good idea to go and reward the teachers. I am a firm believer in any country the teachers should be the highest paid and the most respected people. They have to be. If that happens, the education system changes, the thinking of the society itself changes. So we thought we'll recognize some of the outstanding teachers. And it's not just that I decide who this, who this teacher is going to be. There is an evaluation process. Everything is online. So the Rotarian goes to a school, asks the children very simple questions. Based on Right to Education Act, does your teacher take care of your special needs? Does the teacher spend a little more time with you if you need more time, etc.? Based on that, 10 students and one principal minimum have to be taken and that's what the evaluation does. On evaluation, you come to know who's the best teacher and give the Nation Builder Award. This also helps us to find out who are not the teachers at the top who are at the bottom. Otherwise, I could not go to a school and say, I want to evaluate your teachers, not in a government school by any chance. This helps us do that. And when we do that, these are the teachers that we would want to go for the teacher training program. So that's, these are the Nation Builder Awards being given uh, in different parts of the country. And our ladies wing, the inner wheel, is very, very active in this entire program. So that was T. The next is E is for e-learning. And this is the engine of the entire program. We believe that the game changer in the education system in India is going to be technology. I was so happy a few months back when I met Mr. Nandan Nilekani. This was exactly what he said. Shekhar, uh, three years back, I wouldn't have said this, but today I'm very sure if there is something that's going to change the uh, education system in India, it is going to be technology. And when he says about technology, we better listen to it. <laughs> I'm very happy that the government also now thinks the same way. Just the last week, again, I was with Mr. Javdekar and uh, very happy to inform that now the government, we've been doing this for the last 10 years. 
government is now bringing this into 1 lakh they are getting into 1 lakh 50000 classrooms class 9 and 10 are all going to have audiovisual facilities all going to have audiovisual facilities uh, for education at the highest level. But we start from class one itself. As of now, we've reached out to about 13,000 classrooms. But over the last few months, we have been able to reach out to different. OK, let me just show you what, where we are. So in Karnataka, so what is done is a child starts reading through audiovisual method. Now, 50 kilometers from here, the school teacher may not be as good as some of the best schools in Bangalore. But what's, why should that child in that village school have the disadvantage? This will become the common denominator. So the same film that you are seeing, the same audiovisual that you are seeing here, you'll see also 50 kilometers away. It will also help the teachers understand it better, better ways of teaching. Each day, somebody will come up a better way of telling the same theorem, how to solve it. An audiovisual method, when I saw it first time, my first reaction was, I wish I had the same methodology to read when I was young. It, it makes a lot of difference, better comprehension, better language, quick understanding, better remembrance. So we've been doing this across the country. So this is Uttar Pradesh, that was Karnataka. Right now, the ongoing projects are 10,000 schools have already been done in Gujarat where the curriculum has been developed. In each of the states that we go, the curriculum is developed with the state government. So they may say, we want these changes, make these changes 10, 20 times, we back and forth, we go and finally come to a curriculum. And then three years later, they change it altogether. Right now, we are changing it for Gujarat altogether because they've decided it's going to be CBSC that they want to follow. Okay, so we'll change that also. That's exactly what's being done. It impacts about three and a half million children in Gujarat alone. Uh, with state bank funding, we are doing about 310 schools in Uttar Pradesh, Karnataka, and uh, Maharashtra. We signed an MOU with the Maharashtra government where we're going to go to about 18,000, 18,510 schools. They're going to put one television. We'll put another television in the same school. You can either use the projector or use television. Now we are moving more to television, easier to handle, handle longevity is better, uh, easier to operate for teachers also. And if the classroom is small, a 32 inches TV or a 50 inches TV is good enough. All you need to do is the curriculum is on a pen drive. You just go and attach the pen drive and it starts working. It's as simple as that. It costs about 40,000 rupees to get to one classroom. As of now, we are going just one classroom in every school. It's like a computer lab. That's how it will be, just like we have science labs. Then it will be for the government to reach out to each and every classroom. And the education minister has said that in five years' time, we want to reach every classroom in India. And I think it's possible it is going to happen. So this is when he launched the program in Maharashtra. We've signed for Madhya Pradesh. 15,000 schools, 45,000 schools in Andhra Pradesh, where this year we're going to be doing 5,000 schools, 20,000 schools in Punjab. They are so serious about it. They keep talking to us every third day. They get the vendor who is going to give the software. Every day he's sitting down and they get to details like, we want a turban on this guy. So his software doesn't know, isko pagdi pe nao. Iska kurta ko blue color kar do. Okay, we'll go to that extent, but we want you to say, yes, this is exactly what we want. So a lot of interest from the government, tremendous interest from the government for the program. Projects and pipeline, which are Haryana government is wanting to do a pilot for 2,000 schools. So that's the estimated money that Rotary will have to shell out about nearly 200 crore rupees. We have no clue where the money will come from, but as Gandhi said, find the goal and the means will follow. They always have and I'm sure they will. Impact, two crore children. The next in series is the adult literacy program. This also we did a pilot 
uh, about 60,000 children. We tried this on where we came out with a booklet. Uh, the state curriculum nowadays for adult literacy, if you go and see, is about 200 pages book. Nobody wants to read those books, but they have, don't have an option. That's what the read. So we came up with three books, 15 pages, 20 pages, 20 pages. Using that, a child from class six above, during the summer holidays, taught one adult illiterate. And the results were just outstanding. They could pass the examinations held by NIUS, National Institute of Open Schooling, which is equivalent to class three, which means it's possible. And the best part is, last week when I met Mr. Jaudekar, I presented those three books to him. And he immediately called a meeting next day of the secretariat and said, this is what we want to now do for adult literacy in India. Two days later, three days later, he came to Calcutta and he said, Mr. Mehta, Shekharji, I'm very happy to tell you, NCERT has approved the curriculum that you have suggested. So it's, it's really heartening that the, the, the adult education system is going to change. And let me tell you, world's 33% adult illiterate are in India, 27 crores of them. How do we expect India to be called totally literate till these people are made literate? He had once said, Mr. Javadekar, and he, he said, Shekhar ji, I'm interested in this program. I was small, he said, I used to go with my mother. My mother was a teacher. She used to go and teach these adults. And then men would join. When the numbers became too many, I as a young boy said, OK, Ma, you take care of the women. I'll teach the adults. So this pro program, he really can relate to it. He said, I want this. And in his speech on the International Literacy Day, he said, 27 crore bachche hain, log padte hain India mein. And there are 27 crores who are illiterate. Theoretically, if one taught the other, it, it doesn't happen that way, but theoretically it's possible. So at least in five years, it's definitely possible. So we're very happy that this is working out. So here you see this child trying to teach the adult, not the other way around. And these are those three books that we've developed. Thereafter, that was the first year about 60,000. Next year, we are again added about 25,000. This lady, Kanaklata Murmu, she's from West Bengal. Uh, one day, her daughter came and said, Mom, I need you to help me with this homework. Now, this lady, she did not know how to go about it. She was illiterate. But she came to know that Rotary's conducting Adar Literacy Center. She went there, took classes, and she says, it changed my life altogether. Now she's one of the trainers there at the Swabhiman centers, as we call them. And then when she went to open a bank account, that gentleman pushed a stamp pad. And she said, she took out the pen, signed there, and said, I am no more an anguta chap. So individually, each people, their lives are changing. I've been shown the card, which says five minutes left. So I'll just rush a little. This is another part of the adult literacy program, the skill development where we have done with Lumba Foundation, Lord Lumba of uh, UK, where 30,000 widows or single mothers are going to be provided skill development. Their skill development will be done. And this will be done, 1,000 of them in each of the states of India. The program is just starting on 23rd June. The president of India is starting the program in Delhi. Uh, it will be start with 1,000 in Maharashtra, 1,000 in Bengal, 500 in Madhya Pradesh, 500 in Bihar, and 1,000 in Delhi. So that's where it starts. So that's Sherry Blair and Mr. Banerjee, who is the chief advisor of the literacy mission. Sherry Blair represents the Lumba Foundation. This is another program where Smriti Rani ji had asked us, can you send children back to school? And we agreed. We started the program, a tough job. In Calcutta, when I go drive the car, I see this small girl begging. I tell people, try, get off your car, and try and get this child back to school. And you'll understand how difficult it is to send that one child back to school. But fortunately, because of the efforts of Rotarians, we have been able to do that to 34,000 children. They are under a program called Asha Kiran. These children, they are brought to such centers. These are Asha Kiran centers. Seema Shashi is one such example. 
This is what she used to do. But this is where she is now. That's the center. And post the center, this is where she is. Back to school. And thousands and thousands of children are going back to school under this program. 34,000 children enroll in the program at 498 centers that we run, more than 500 teachers across 13 states in India. And the last is Happy Schools, where we get into infrastructure. Bangalore leads Mr. Uh, Pandurang Shetty's club itself. They run an outstanding program converting 106 schools in Bangalore into happy schools. You go to those schools and you'll really see the sea change that has come into those schools. Now these are classrooms which you should have seen these classrooms earlier. They did not even have plaster on their walls and now they are beautiful places. So imagine if there is a school which is painted well, which is beautiful, you want to go to the school, the teacher has already been trained. The methodology to teach is e-learning. What better would you want to do? This is the most an NGO would be able to do, and I'm sure the government will pick up. Of the five programs, they've already picked up on two, the e-learning program and the adult literacy program. The children's program, they want us to take forward because naturally that's the, the, these are children who are coming out of the net. They are, they've not been able to hold them up. Library creation, this is just a side product of the Happy School program. Uh, two years back, we had uh, told Mr. Javadikar we will set up 5,000 libraries. In just two years, we've been able to set up 4,000 libraries. Healthy donations from different uh, people who actually are about to pulp their books. Donate them to us and we set these libraries up, adding equal numbers from our side also. Various people, so starting from uh, Mr. Kailash Satyarthi to different uh, organizations who've come forward, partnered with us. Uh, so the partnerships I'll quickly run through. Uh, Learning Links, uh, LaborNet, Macmillan, British Council, various partnerships. Fortunately, uh, the program also caught the eye of the Prime Minister and we got recognition from him too. A Lot of people have been supporting us and one of the purposes to come here was to ask IIM Bangalore the director is here. We would you want I am Bangalore to become a knowledge partner for, for us. The programs that we do, the Asha Kiran program, is it having the impact? The adult literacy program, is it having the impact that we are wanting to? The e-learning where we are now supposed to go to 1,50,000 schools, is it creating the impact that we are wanting? We are doing a program. We think we are doing a great job. But it is you who needs to tell whether the job is good enough or not. So that's a request that I leave for I am Bangalore. Uh, not too much, we don't expect anything, just uh, this. Fortunately, we have been in the news on the right times. So in one day, we were in 175 newspapers. For once, we were trending on social media. It was a heartening thing to see that people do respond to good work if it is happening. Friends, thank you very much. It's so gratifying to see the hall filling up although it's, it's still fairly cavernous, so uh, we'll just give people a little more time to come. Uh, thank you for that wonderful talk, uh, PRID Shekhar Mehta. Um, I, see, I look across and see a lot of familiar faces uh, who've uh, braved the traffic to get here, and so a big shout out to all of you. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, uh, it's going to be Professor P.D. Joes. Uh, we're going to have uh, she's finally arrived. Our district governor, Asha Prasannukumar, is here. So as soon as she finishes that conversation, we're going to have her come up and say a few words. Dignities over here. Let me recognize the presence of our PRID Shekhar Mehta, who has come all the way uh, to address us and hear our, our uh, elite speakers, where we'll be looking forward to hear from them about this trial blazer conclave especially and uh, to get imb connected with our education support here i recognize the presence of uh, prid 
Pandrang Shetty and all the past district governors here and many of our Rotarians and also the IAMB uh, staff and colleagues and the directors here. First of all, let me congratulate the Rotary Bangalore downtown for this innovative and initiative idea of reaching beyond to see that uh, support like IMB to with our Rotary District 3190 will be a big showcase to reach out to our literacy mission. As Mr. Shaker Mehta right now said, like after polio eradication, the national Rotary National um, Mission felt that literacy is the next very, very important criteria where India badly needs. And last three, four years, I'm going to introduce it. we have been working and every Rotary Club is coming out with lot of initiatives and lot of nice programs. And let me tell you, we should congratulate Shekhar Mehta for really dedicating the way he is leading our entire RI district, uh, Rotary uh, India Found. Thank you very much. And all the ideas like Nation Builder Awards, as he really said that it is really encouraging the teachers. Like in every school, the students are the one who evaluate the teachers. And then we go to recognize them with a Nation Builder Awards. The concept of that was really like it is teachers who, want, who has to be motivated, who has to think beyond their usual style of learning so that that imparts with the students. And this year, as uh, Shekharji showed that Kaila Satyarthi was here to our district and he has addressed the young youth in our Intercity General Forum of Youth Service. Uh, where the Rotaractors and Interactors were there for almost 1,000 children were there and it was very nice to hear the address from him. And one more very good news is uh, very recently uh, Israel Consulate, uh, Dana has agreed to get their trainers who has really trained in a different innovative way to train our teachers here. Uh, July 15, 16, 17, 18th are the four days where we are imparting the training from the really renowned uh, trainers for the teachers where we will be covering even the private schools, the big schools and the government school teachers to reach more than 1,500 teachers in a span of four days. That has been signed just two days back. This is for your information. And our district this year has really done very well, reaching about more than 4,000 teachers training and also Two lakh Raila students has been touched to impart that the students get a motivation and think beyond. This is the whole idea of this trailblazer because we have to think beyond breaking all our regular rules to see that we make a difference to this society. I, I once again thank all the organizers and the Rotarians of downtown, the President Raghu and Ramdas and the whole team led by, guided by our Madhura here uh, to think beyond and do something very innovative because reaching to a bigger step is always a good idea and a great feeling for Rotary District 3190. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've got to love it when uh, one of the speakers gets us right back on time by uh, the brevity but uh, the substance of her, of her talk. Thank you very much, P uh, DJ Asha. Um, just before I introduce our second speaker, and we have a panel of five, uh, I must tell you that um, the person, if you see the slides changing there almost seamlessly and all of that working, we decided to take our best looking tech savvy Rotarian from downtown and put him behind this desk. So I want him to stand up and for you to give him a round of applause. This is Rotarian uh, Bipin Toro. Thank you, Bipin. So our second speaker is uh, to try and uh, introduce this speaker in these uh, sylvan surroundings would border on the sacrilege, on, on sacrilege. Uh, Dr. P.D. Jose is professor of strategy and chair of digital learning right here in IAM Bangalore. And I know that many Rotarians and many friends that I have invited to this conclave uh, said that they know of him and have worked with him. 
His academic credentials are impeccable, and his professional associations are worldwide. His corporate consultations envelop the largest and the best known corporates across industries in the world. And, but he's here today to talk about how online and blended learning can impact K through 12 school learning. Ladies and gentlemen, please sit back and be informed by this awesome speaker. Professor. I'm really delighted to be here, but I have to say I feel a bit inadequate. Uh, after listening to you, looking at the fantastic work that you're doing, I really want to applaud you because I thought the work they did needed a really good applause. Uh, so, I, you know, I have to tell you that I don't really work in the school sector, except for the, the fact that I've had the benefit and the um, disadvantages of, you know, what we call as a, you know, school system. Uh, so I don't really have a lot of insights about school education, but I do have a few insights about how we might look at education in the context of uh, the changing technology. Uh, I just thought I will highlight a few, few things that, you know, that stare us in the face today with not a great deal of detail. You come to a business school, then we've got to tell you that the world economy is changing, right? So the world economy is changing, and the fact that globalization is a, a very important uh, constituent of our life. It, it seamlessly cuts through everything that we do, from the flowers that you buy, to the fruits that you eat, to the books that you read, to the music that you listen, is so obvious to all of us, but I thought it's a point uh, worth making because it has implications for education. Technology, as Mr. Mehta said, is really changing, and you can talk about a whole range of technologies. Uh, I just put the, uh, you know, uh, the Gartner, uh, hype curve for educational technologies, but you can go from bio, nano, ICT, uh, you know, AI, uh, AR, VR, you know, a whole range of acronyms, all the 26 letters used again and again, but you really have a range of te technologies that are transforming the way uh, uh, learning is managed and, you know, learners themselves are managed. Uh, I think the interesting part to look at is also that people are changing. If you look by people are changing, what I meant is demographic uh, shifts that are occurring. For instance, just a simple fact that 40% of the uh, Indian population today is less than 20 years old. Uh, but I do not know whether you realize all of these kids study, maybe not, let's say, let's say, because they're they are in the colleges by the time they're 20s, uh, about 80% of them study in classrooms that were designed for the 1900s. Sometimes they're not designed at all. I mean, there are no classrooms, right? So you have a situation which is really uh, alarming, and there's a mismatch between the aspirations, the capabilities of the students, and what we are able to offer. There may be a possibility, and there is, of course, there are implications of that. Uh, so, you know, we, the, uh, we are talking about 40% in this range, and you can see that's the future for us. So broadly, if you put all of this together, we find that Education's landscape is changing. The first is what we might call as globalization. And we see that increasingly education is becoming global in a sense that academic brands are global, faculty are moving globally, students are moving globally. In fact, I would venture to say that much of, uh, you know, uh, much of the educational system in the UK, with all, you know, with all due respects to you, ma'am, and, and to Australia, I think, and maybe some parts of Europe, some part of uh, US, are really sustained by students from Asia and from students from India and so on. Uh, increasingly, we have a situation, of course, uh, you know, we have a situation asked, you know, these students are really uh, global citizens in a way, and you have global brands, you have practically every uh, worthwhile global institution, university, setting its footprints in India. So that's the first part of the story. So education is becoming global. Educational services are becoming definitely global. There is no question about it. The second is the question of disruption. Now, we're talking about technology disrupting, and there are multiple instances of that, but the fact that technology has made today uh, education very scalable uh, in a, at a very low cost, and I will come back to that in a little while, but there are a number of dis disruptive technologies. 
which are really changing education. The third is what I might like to call as democratization. The fact that you have this, you know, uh, let's say, these 20 somethings who have grown up in a world very different from ours, who have different aspiration levels, who have access to you know, a, a, you know, global media and so on, who socialize very differently, now they're demanding better education. In other words, there is an increasing clamor for high quality education. There's an increasing clamor for democratizing education. In other words, why would good education be limited to your legacy? You know, whether you have good genes and, or good, you know, rich parents. There is no reason for it to be limited because today you can use technology to literally leapfrog over many problems or, or infrastructural or financial uh, hurdles that you might have faced earlier. So that's the, the broad trend, uh, you know, that we observe. And I think if you put the technology and the globalization together and people together, you find jobs are also changing. In other words, you know, we find we are, we are not only really training these children uh, with the technology of 1900s, we are also training them to work in the 1900s, and we are still in the 21st century. We are already in the 21st century, right? So there is really a problem. There's a mismatch between what is offered and what is required. Uh, to give you a simple example, I mean, this of course, it's not very clear, but uh, it's, an, it's a very interesting study that talks about what kind of skills are required for the, you know, the, uh, the, the generation of the future, the workers of the future. So several things, you know, words that we are not normally very familiar with, sense making, social intelligence, uh, adaptive thinking, cross-cultural competency, computational thinking. There is not enough time to talk about all of this. The references are there in the presentation. You could have a look at it. The point I'm trying to make is that the skills and competencies that we expect our future workers to have, we are not able to impart with the education that we have. And this mismatch is quite visible also if you look at the kind of jobs that are, li that are likely to become most prominent in the future. For instance, you know, there's an interesting study that was done to see what, are the, what will be the top jobs in 2030. Quite interesting, from body part maker, I just picked the top ten, body part maker to nanomedic to quarantine enforcer, these are words that we have not even heard of. Right? And this is just not the story of a remote school somewhere. I'm talking, uh, you know, this is the story of every school everywhere, every higher educational institution and so on. By and large, the point I'm trying to make is that we're using outdated technology. By technology, I mean infrastructure of any kind. And we are really not uh, uh, making our workers or making our, our, our young people either future ready or in terms of skills or in terms of employability. So there is a serious problem. And that problem generally comes from the fact that we still adopt a 20th century learning model, or maybe actually it's a learning model that has been there for the last 20 centuries, which is intense faculty-student interactions in a brick and mortar classroom. Now, if you look at the 21st century learner, if you have a young kid somewhere, many of you are young, uh, and if you have a young sibling, for a child, you realize that they're very different from the kind of people that, you know, people of my generation would have been. And I was just trying to map what, what they would be, for instance. Uh, here are a few, you know, characteristics you could kind of uh, map onto them. They're very distracted people. Very difficult to get a young kid or a young person to pay attention for long periods of time. They're digital natives. At best, we can call ourselves as digital immigrants. Most of us are not even that. But you know, uh, uh, you know, young kids today, they're born with an iPad or an iPhone in their hands, literally, right? They're multitaskers. They're visually oriented. Uh, they think, you know, some people think in words, some think in, uh, you know, maybe figures and so on. But this generation is very visually oriented. And they're also very impatient. Uh, they're more focused on skills. If you, as you move, you know, further up in age, they're more focused on skills, not on information, because for information there is Wikipedia, right? Traditional education was, you know, you stand here and you download all the information onto the students. And that was fine in an age of information asymmetry, where the teacher always knew more than the student. 
But today, in, in a campus like this, and most places it's true, I think, that the teacher is the least informed because as you're speaking about something, your students are kind of verifying whether what you say is right on their phones or whatever. So you have a situation there. So then, you know, kind of, you know, passing on information as insight is passive. It is really not going to work. Uh, they are looking for personalization. They're looking for new experiences, more immersive experiences. And today, education is increasingly being seen as not as a one-time shot uh, at a secure job, which is the way we looked at education, but it is seen as a life, lifelong endeavor. And I think partly market forces do play a role in this, but partly it's also the way the generation is changing. If you've read yesterday's newspaper, there was an article that talked about Wipro uh, putting forward a policy uh, which said that unless you reskill yourself, you will not get your increment. Uh, but of course, companies are always last on the curve if you really look at, but smart kids have al already figured this out. In fact, if you look at our corporate training programs, I remember when I joined here 20 years ago, or when I started my academic career even before that, maybe 25 years ago, normally uh, to be sent to training meant two things from a corporate. One, you were rewarded, then you went to Hawaii, or you were punished because they wanted you out, you know, and then, uh, sorry, what happened? Oh, it's went off, okay. I didn't press anything, okay. No, it's gone. Okay, so uh, then it meant that, you know, they wanted you out of the, uh, you know, location, so they sent you to some remote place for training. But today, most of the people who come here uh, tend to pay out of their own pockets to come here. So people do value education, and they know that they need to be reskilled and so on. So that's the kind of population that we have. Okay, now we're stuck on this. Okay, can you just use the next one? Yeah. Maybe it's the battery. It's coming? Okay. So what we have, yes. So what we have, what we need, is a different model. One that's need-based, and maybe in a virtual space in an asynchronous manner. Why do I say about asynchronous? Because, you know, I teach students here. They are awake at 10 o'clock in the night. They go to sleep at 3. And then, they, you know, if I have an 8 o'clock class, they're somewhat drowsy in my class. Whereas at 10, I'm fast asleep. So there is a lack of sync right there itself. And, and that's, the world, that's where the world is. So if you look at, uh, you know, uh, the way the world is evolving, the way our students are oriented, uh, we find that there is a big mismatch. But we still tend to define excellent education using very, very old models. So what is excellence for us? And this I find really paradoxical. Uh, we define excellence as excluding, exclusion. Our best institutions are the ones which are most difficult to get in. Now it's a paradox because if you take great students, you should do something really terrible, you know, to kind of make sure they will do badly in life. So by and large, if you, even if you don't intervene, they will do very well in life. The point that I'm trying to make is, you cannot define excellence uh, by exclusion. So we close our gates, we say, you know, a few hundred thousand may apply, and the few that we get in, you know, because it's so difficult to get in, we are great. I think that's the wrong way of defining you know, excellence. We have to define excellence the reverse, excellence as inclusion more people you take in, the more you're able to take in, the more lives you're able to transform, that's an excellent institution. And in, you know, in education, we're really not talking about it that way. Second, we, our traditional models have been legacy and uh, location constraint. Great institutions in some definite places, you've got to be physically there. And as I said, legacy, either you need to have really good genes or you need to have really rich parents. Yes, so all of those uh, and, and so on. And education we've seen as linear class 1 to 12 and so on. Technology, we use a lot of technology, but technology has always been an add-on. And uh, you've seen this in multiple places. I've heard of colleges uh, or institutions where, you know, fantastic computer, computer labs have been set up, but they're shut down, they're closed because the principal is not really sure what to do with this. He's worried, real experience, I'm not making this up. He was worried that the students would misuse the lab and therefore he shut it down because that's the easy thing to do and so on. So this whole model needs to change. What we need is to have you know, a model which says the more we include, uh, you know, that, is, that defines excellence and all of this. Technology is blended in. Uh, I have only five minutes, so I'm going to go really fast. So, so basically the whole idea that can you use technology to take education to zero marginal cost? Because a big problem with education has been that it's very infrastructure intensive and, uh, and therefore it's very expensive. 
and education has become really, really expensive. If you, you know, if you see this, uh, this, this beautiful chart about what does it cost to educate your child in India, it's horribly expensive. And the sad part is, I really like, sir, when you said that we don't recognize our teachers enough. We are willing to pay more for our maid servants than for your teachers. It's, it's such a tragic situation that if you want a maid servant to look after a child, you pay 15,000 rupees in Bangalore. But if you're a teacher, you get, uh, you know, looking after 20 kids all through the day, all through the year, you'll get some 40,000 if you're really very lucky. So we have completely um, uh, messed up that system. So what you need is new things, new models, and, you know, uh, Khan Academy is a good example where you know, people have put in together small things and so on. But the point I want to make is that classrooms have changed and you really need to change even more. Uh, just, anyway, since you have no time, I'm not really going to show you the videos. But basically, now there is a possibility that you can actually scale up education at zero marginal cost. And, and the best uh, way to look at that is the way MOOCs have evolved. Uh, I'm sure most of you would know what MOOCs are, but essentially what it means is you take the classroom experience into kind of uh, small, biteable, small chunks of uh, videos and exercises exercise and so on and make it available. So this MOOCs the, the acro is an acronym for Massive Open Online Courses, started around 2011 at uh, Stanford. Uh, within a span of seven years, we have over different platforms, 81 million students, 800 universities, and 9,500 courses, and courses in every area that you can think of. Courses at every level that you can think of. You want to learn English, arts, language, religion, ethics, finance, you know, artificial intelligence, there's stuff. And there are platforms of that kind, edX, and we are part of that Coursera. And there's, of course, the government initiative, which is SWAM, uh, which also has, in fact, NIOS, and all of them are part of it. They've registered 14 lakhs teachers on that. Uh, and there are, of course, very professional courses and so on. The point I want to kind of kind of very quickly, I'm going to take two, three minutes more and conclude, is that today education is, the, is at an inflection point. And I'm very glad you have contributed to transforming education, but I think the next step up in education is not just about NGOs or educational institutions alone. It is about innovation. It is about entrepreneurs. It's about investments. Unless we bring in those actors into this space, we will not be able to transform education. We need to recognize that even charity needs to be world class today. Even charity needs to leverage the best of technology. And it's not about bringing more of the old back into the classroom. It's actually redefining the classroom. It's redefining learning. So, you know, let me show you a few examples. And, and, and by the way, this, these are good, great business models too. So it is not that charity uh, is seen as, you know, some kind of a pocket draining exercise. You can't see this, this Uda City and a couple of other, you know, um, uh, basically online learning platforms, all of them valued at a billion plus dollars. Our own badges valued at a billion plus dollars. So there is a great deal of revenue in this. Of course, this is a purely out and out commercial model. That's, the model, that's not the model that I recommend. But I'm saying there's an opportunity to partner and we should partner. But we need to recognize that education is not as it was in the past. It leverages a host of technologies. It leverages, uh, you know, for instance, gaming or, you know, whatever. And it kind of, uh, I think, you know, I thought I was very innovative when I said we need to not educate, we need to educate people because they have an option today, right? And we need to really develop in them a passion for learning. So I defined that word and my young daughter looked on the web and she said, Dad, you know, this is all old fashioned. I all, but somebody has already defined it. So, <laughs> so the point is you would not have had a Shah Rukh Khan selling you know, K-12 education in the past, but you need that. If that is the case, then I think we need to rethink, right? We need to rethink. But so I want to stop by just defining excellence because that really is important in any, in any initiative that you look at. We normally put reach and richness as very important. Reach is, yeah. Sorry, I just put a time, that's the reason. Okay. Okay, dismiss, okay. So reach is very important. Richness is very important, but I think relevance is the next question that we need to look at. Are what we're teaching relevant? Is the rigor, because you're going to be benchmarked against the world, the best in the world, and is the resilience? Resilience, by resilience I mean that uh, technologies are changing today, requirements are changing, job skills are changing, jobs themselves are changing, and therefore is your education future-proof? And therefore you have to ask the question, is your educator also future-proof? So transformation really happens at the educator level. 
Uh, and therefore, when you are saying nation builder, that is absolutely it makes eminent sense. Uh, so we have to make our teachers future-proof first, and then we have to make our education system future-proof. But I don't think that's the initiative of any one entity. I think we need to bring in serious money into this. We need to bring in young entrepreneurs. All the companies, billion-plus companies, you know, dollar-plus companies that I talked about, or many of the companies I now get to interact uh, because of you know, uh, working with this digital learning at IIM Bangalore. On an average, every, everyone is less than 30 years old. So these are all young people with great ideas. And you know, we bring in traditional institutions, uh, young entrepreneurs, and good serious money and you know, uh, you know, organizations like the road track clubs. Then you know, we can actually transform education. And that, I think, should be the goal. Thank you. I must say that each one of the speakers we lined up for today is besides being subject matter experts, they're extremely busy people. So I really appreciate the time they've taken to actually come here. I know Professor Joes was extremely busy with his classes and uh, managed to get us his material just this morning. Uh, and I do really appreciate it. Also, you'll all get a chance to interact with him again during a, a small segment that we have at the end of the speaker segment, which is for about 30 minutes. So please, I do encourage you to ask questions, write them down, pass them on to the people who are walking down the aisle. With that, let's come to our third speaker. And again, as I said, uh, this is not a formal profile introduction. Those are in the booklets with you. What you'll hear from me is a little bit of, uh, uh, a little bit of levity, hopefully. If you thought you saw a suave gentleman ride in today on a Harley Davidson, it might well have been our next speaker. A first-generation entrepreneur, Syed Sultan Ahmed, founded EduMedia, now christened as LXL Ideas. A passionate educator, Sultan is recipient of six prestigious uh, President of India uh, National Film Awards for production. His team explores the amazing possibilities of using films in classrooms to help children navigate the real world. Sultan holds a postgraduate degree from MIT and is a certified master trainer from Dale Carnegie. So let's put our hands together for this true Bangalore gem. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Rotary, for giving me this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, Mr. Mehta for sharing us uh, the whole concept of teach, very inspirational, and Dr. Joes, uh, you've made my life a lot more easier because what you've spoken is a precursor to uh, the kind of work that we do at LXL Ideas. So I'm going to take this opportunity uh, you know, to talk about stuff that's happening out there in the minds of children and what organizations like ours are trying to do. Uh, to begin with, there's a slight context, and that's pretty important. Uh, when I was in school, I was an outstanding student, and I was made to stand outside class very often. And the reason why I was made to stand out of classroom was because I spoke a lot. Till one teacher figured out that that's actually a talent and put me in the debate club. And it kind of transformed my life. I am a product of Raila. I remember attending that in the mid-90s, right? And I have a very strong connection with Rotary, with lots of friends and family with with Rotary. Moving on, uh, I was in a rut where in our country everyone's in a rut because when you're in 10th and 12th grade, you have to study well. And when you study well, you uh, do medicine or engineering. I did not get a seat in medicine, so what do you think I did? Oh, yes. And I had to study a lot. I actually studied a lot. Uh, I actually studied for seven years. Normally, people study for four. The good thing that happened was it gave me an opportunity to be the cultural secretary of a college not very far from here. It's called the Anand Saga for almost four years. Nobody gets an opportunity to be a cult sec for four years. And that formed the basis of my career and my work in education. Because I realized there is something wrong, not with me, but the world around me, because they're not recognizing a talent. And that's how the whole idea of the work started. Dr. Jose, like I mentioned, uh, talked to you about what's happening to our kids today. They're very, very different. They're tech savvy, they demand a lot of freedom, uh, they expect transparency. 
Yeah, that's one of the challenges which teachers can't uh, take these days. And they show wild creativity. They're creative, not in the organized and the traditional sense that you and I know creativity as. It's, it's a form of creativity which is so difficult for us as adults to understand. And also they can do many things at the same time. Right? right from the time they are one year old, they can eat and watch videos, which is what we're teaching them. So we started the first dose of multitasking and they do a fantastic job of it. But anyways, these are the kids. And uh, what's the kind of approach that they are looking for? They're looking for an approach which is a kind of mix of all of these. Uh, it should be integrated and interdisciplinary. Uh, I'm not going to get into too many details of this. The classrooms have to be global. Uh, 21st century skills, we've talked about all of this, technology, multimedia, student centers, project-based, and adapting to and creating personal and social change and lifelong learning. I'm going to stay with that one point. 18 years, 20 years is normally what an average student in this country goes to school, and when they come out of it, most of them are unemployable. The question is, what the hell are we doing with them in schools and colleges? And in this entire process, we forget there is a life that they have to live, and our education does not focus on life. We don't create them to be better citizens. We don't create them to be better family members. We don't create them to be better colleagues working in a workplace, because the focus was grades and marks and not life. And the whole idea of my work, and right from the beginning, I sound very, uh, you know, organized and structured, but the whole idea was there's something missing in education and probably it's taken me two decades to realize that missing piece and that's the focus on life itself. Our education does not create individuals who are fit to live. We are hoping that they are going to be fit to work and we know that we are failing miserably in that uh, context. So what do we do with LXL, at LXL Ideas is that's the reason why we rebranded from EduMedia to LXL Ideas. LXL literally means learning the X factor of life because our schools and colleges are teaching all the A to Z and oftentimes the X factor is missing. And uh, we've got four different companies or four different brands that work under us. I'm going to be focusing on film pedagogy today. Mentor is a focus on school leadership. It's a print magazine, and the idea of the print magazine is can you pick up best practices and share it with one another. And our belief is that if you could bring together all the good practices of schools from across, you actually can make an ideal school, almost. But the problem with education is that the principal, who is the leader of a center of education, they're the ones who learn the least, and more importantly, they don't learn from one another. And the idea of Mentor was simple, can we share best practices? At Crayon, uh, very proud to have created some of India's largest engagements for children because we believe at LXL that uh, the best way to build confidence or to build life skills in students is to give them opportunities. We brought in the Spell Bee into India we, for the longest time. We organized the Holix Viskids, which was one of the world's and definitely the country's largest literary and cultural festival, or the quiz called the Dell Champs, or the Financial Quest, or more recently we are now working with the Literacy Mission of India and doing the Dell Aram, which just last year trained over 100,000 teachers on digital literacy from over 5,000 schools. So these are some of the work that we do with Crayon. But this afternoon, I want to focus on my work in the direction of film pedagogy. Which is the world's largest filmmaking country? Oh yes, by far it's India. Which is the world's largest young population? And we make the least number of films for children. If you was an average person picked up a lens of education, looked at film or cinema, you would realize it's an audiovisual medium, it's storytelling, it's entertainment, and it's education. And as a teacher, I can tell you I can use any one to teach. And here's a lethal combination. Right from our hairstyles to what we wear, to the language we speak, to the fact that Malayali weddings have mehendi ceremonies today is all thanks to cinema. And that's the kind of influence that cinema can have. But we've been very naive and we use cinema or relegated it to just for entertainment. I'm using this word very consciously. We've relegated cinema just for entertainment because it's way more powerful than that. 
1942, Kismat was the name of a movie. The song was titled Dur Hato E Dunya Walo, Hindustan Hamara Hai. Almost a freedom marching song that, you know, resonated in the entire nation. And both the lyricist and the music director had to go underground. I mean, that's what cinema could do. Or a Nehru, not many people know, funding uh, movies directed by Manoj Kumar and talking about uh, the farming and the industrial revolution through his films. Talk about social media those days. So moving on, this is one space I think we have highly underutilized. So what we did was very simple. There was a need and the need was to prepare children for life. You need to talk to children about several issues and they are so important to talk about. Religious sensitivity, cultural sensitivity, respect for elders or following traffic rules. We need to talk to very little ones about the good touch and the bad touch or you need to talk to the adolescents about uh, you know, adolescent related issues. You need to talk to a 10th standard about choosing a career and you need to talk to a 9th you know, standard about the fact that there's going to be bullying back in their uh, colleges. There are several issues which are very relevant for children and their growing up. Our houses are no longer centers of conversation for such relevant topics. Schools don't have the time because right from grade 5, we've started dual programs. Have you heard of dual programs in grade 5? Preparing children for IIT. In grade 5. Wow. And all this in the name of education. So what we felt was there was an opportunity for us to look at, for the longest time now, for 15 years, I've been a life skills trainer. And the, the format that I've always used is a traditional format. Go into classrooms and run a life skills program. And we grew, and we grew, and we grew very big. At one point of time, around seven years ago, we were running the country's largest life skills program. In fact, only one of our programs, which was partnered with the Akshaya Patra Foundation, we were running a program for over 100,000 kids, and I was running a big army of trainers. That's what we were doing. But then we realized no matter how much you scale, that's when you realize how little we uh, have impacted because the scale that we're talking about is 1.7 million schools. And here I was doing 100,000 kids and people thought we were doing a great job. So we were looking at a solution that could scale up and impact children with life lessons. So what we did was just created some films. So I'll just move on to the next slide, which will probably show you a clip of one of our films. I hope there's volume on this. Nadia! Mom, I was making the ball fly. You want to see my temper fly? Mom, I'm going school. What are you doing? Super Rocket Kaka Invention. One, two, three, boom! Oh no! How can I be a superhero, Nano? I don't even have any superpowers. You must be the first superhero who is unaware of her superpower. The story of a little girl who wants to be a superhero and uh, she doesn't realize that even being kind or kindness is the power of a superhero and this entire film doesn't even use the word kindness in it and yet puts across a message and incidentally made by Charu Sri Roy who had made uh, lipstick under my burka uh, that movie went on to win the national award for the best film on family values a couple of years ago now imagine this was just a trailer, it's not the film, it's a 15 minute film. Children watching this in their classrooms, following this up with a workbook. NID was our partner and we developed the workbook based on the film. So every film is a chapter and based on the film you're working on the workbook and then there are activities for the teachers to do and projects for children to do all around the film. In, in fact, in this film, the children had to do an activity where they're communicating with their grandparents and coming back and putting up a project. It's a fun thing to do. So, ladies and gentlemen, happy to report that seven years, eight years now in my eighth year, 
Eight years ago when we started this project, my mother thought, was the first uh, critic, and she's been my biggest critic, she thought, now I've completely lost it. She thought 20 years ago that because I decided to work in the space of education, I had lost it, so she sent me to a counsellor. And eight years ago when I decided to make films, she thought, now you've completely lost it. So six years on, with not just six presidents of national awards, we have over a million children in India who are not learning life skills through a textbook or a workbook, but are watching films. And one thing that I've seen is that in the PTA meetings, and this is my claim to fame, in the PTA meetings, the parents are talking about life skills and not just math. Because the children are going back home and talking about these issues and they're discussing them. Over these seven or eight years, what we also realized is that if we are only focusing on children, it's not enough. You need to focus on the other bigger influences, the teachers and the parents. And one of the biggest challenges of education, like it's already mentioned, is teachers. And I would like to also bring in the parent, parental education as another key challenge going forward. In fact, anyone who runs a school in this country will tell you the problem is not the children or the teachers. The problem is the parent. And the more educated you are, the bigger the problem you can be because you think you know it. Right. And you need to explain to parents a lot of stuff. And how do you do that? There are not many trained parenting counselors in this country. And even if you do have a few handful, I'm talking about 4,000 schools only in Bangalore. And how often can you go out there and get a parenting counselor? Here's a medium that does a fantastic job. And we've made some phenomenally beautiful films. Let's move on and watch a clip of one of our parenting films. They call it the seven-year age. Yes, I have changed. You have changed too. Yeah. I couldn't help it. It's called marriage. Has art class tomorrow. Why can't you accept it? But that's but before I had so a baby, one of the It's not the end of the world. The you had the whole morning. day to do your yes. shopping. Why did you leave it for last tired. minute? Why don't you try looking after Arya for one whole day? I don't mean it. Adika, please, Bodo. Okay. In America and Iraq fought, who paid the price? Afghanistan. So issues like parental conflict and how does it impact a child or how do children pick up language or habits from parents or you know how do you teach values to children these are you know some of those factors that are so difficult to put across and here's a fantastic medium to do that we also have films for parents positive of time you can always log on to school cinema on the YouTube and see the trailers you don't get to watch the full films because you need to buy a license for that Something very interesting has happened in the past five or six years. I'm just going to take one more minute extra maybe. Uh, and that is we've had our films featured in over 400 now, almost 400 international film festivals. And across the world, when I went to film festivals, I realized two things. One is that some of the best films made for children are made by independent filmmakers, not the big production houses, all right, or the big, big film houses. And uh, the best place to watch these films are children's film festivals. The second thing that I notice is children don't go to children's film festivals. And that's a fact across the globe. Children's festivals are very elitist. And as an educator, I would want every child to watch those films because that's proper content. And today's day and age, since we're talking about education, I have to admit we are questioning the very idea of literacy. Literacy is not reading and writing because our children are not reading. They are not going to write. And technology tells them you don't even need to write, right? So we are questioning this very aspect of the word literacy. So children today are increasingly being so visual. That means if I were to start a school today, I would not give them a pen and pencil alone. I would also give them a camera to make films because that's how they're going to be creating content of the future. So children need to be aware and get exposed. How many of you here think that children, it's good for children to read books? Put up your hands. But not all book, books are good to read, right? Not all book, good, books are good to read. We need to show them relevant. And by the way, between the age of 16 to 6 to 16, even YouTube 
confirms that they've got the least amount of good content for children. 6 to 16, very, very little content. So what did we do was I asked my team, if children don't go to film festivals, can we take a film festival to children? And this is exactly what happened. I'll show you a quick video for another minute. Yeah. So last year we did an experiment. one of those few countries which makes the least number of films for children. We are organizing today and launching an international kids film festival. A film can grab the attention of a student very, very quickly. Watch something new, you can actually enjoy the festival. So the schools own the festival. They have the infrastructure, they have the children. Some of the biggest cities in this country or in the small towns, the biggest auditoriums are in the school. Right? Their children, the families, neighboring government schools, all of them came to watch films in over 30 countries. India's largest and the oldest children's film festival happens in Hyderabad once in two years. The last time it happened, there were 19 odd thousand children who participated. As a pilot, we had over a million kids who participated in the film festival. So that's the success. I just asked my team, uh, films are from, over, from across the globe. The issue is relevant for children across the globe. Why are we doing this in India? So this year, we would be doing this event in at least 20 countries. So that's the International Kids Swim Festival uh, 2018. And I'm just going to leave you with an idea that we're working towards. Because of school cinema, we create our own content. Because of the film festival, we curate content and are in touch with filmmakers across the world that make children's content. Every time I walked into a school, there's something very interesting behavior that I've noticed of a school principal. They would show you around the place, and uh, they're very proud of the infrastructure they've created. And this was a few months ago. I was in a swanky school in Dehradun. I don't want to name the school. And I went into this library, which is almost 100 year old, and uh, very instinctively a question came out. So I asked the principal, uh, the library is fantastic, but you only have books. So he gave me that look. It's a library. I mean, that look, which is, God damn it, it's a library. It has to be books. I said, but children don't read books. And that germinated an idea of a film library. So the next thing that would be coming out of our stable of film pedagogy would be a film library. We would hopefully uh, you know, democratize the way books are distributed because in a con conventional library you have one book and only one kid can borrow it. And through technology you can have all parents and all children watching meaningful content back in their homes or in the school through our film library. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the direction of work that we're trying to do at LXL Ideas. Film pedagogy is not a word that you'd heard before today. Uh, mark the words, we're probably the only ones on the planet doing this. Thank you very much. Whatever Sultan was uh, eating or drinking before he got here, I want to have that too. <laughs> Great energy, thank you very much. Lest you think that we are somewhat low on diversity, we are not. So we've kind of saved one of our best for, if you will, the penultimate speaker. Beth is currently the head of blended learning at the British Council in India. I said to her when, when she just walked in that that picture does not do her credit. 
you will see her when she comes up and speaks to you. She's been in English learning, uh, she's been in English language teaching since 1998 and in India since 2011. She's a strong believer in the role of technology in education and in measurable outcomes. Her talk today promises to inform us about the effective approaches to online learning and training and a recent British Council program with government schools uh, which if, uh, impacts teachers across India. So we're delighted, Beth, that you were able to come all the way down from Delhi to join us. Uh, and I'm sure your talk will be fascinating. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and come down to a lovely, cool, rainy Bangalore after a boiling hot Delhi. Um, I, um, as I've been introduced, I'm the head of blended learning at the British Council in India. And by blended learning, we mean looking at um, a mix of teaching face-to-face um, -face using technology or in the classroom and mixing that with digital um, for example, self-access uh, applications. So what do we do at the British Council? Um, you probably know we do lots of things. One of the things that we've been involved in for the last 80 years is English language teaching and assessment, and that's the area that I work in. And obviously, we work in the digital field as well in English language teaching and assessment. We have websites, we have our Learn English websites, Teach English websites, Learn English Kids, Learn English Teens, all full of content, free content, to enable um, learners of English and teachers of English to um, engage with the language. Um, we're active on social media. We have English in India Facebook page, Teach English in India Facebook page, we have a Geo channel, uh, we have apps uh, with free and paid for content. So Job Seekers, you'll see here, is one of the apps that we use. Uh, you can see we've got Learn English Through Cricket, which is a website that we have in partnership with Chris Shrikant. Um, we have MOOCs, which are available on the FutureLearn platform. And the MOOCs center around teaching skills, not just English teaching skills, but teaching skills in general and around English language skills. So it could be uh, an email writing course or um, an IELTS preparation course. Uh, we have self-access courses and we have online taught courses. And you'll see my English here, which is uh, my baby, which is the course that we have that is fully online, but it's a blended course. So there is asynchronous work and asynchronous means the self-access, the stuff that you can do in your own time, and synchronous classroom teaching, but the classroom is via video conferencing. And I'm gonna look at what we've learned about delivering online training and supporting online training to get better outcomes today. I'm gonna look at what the success factors are, and I, I hope you find that this is complementary to the previous speakers rather than repetitive because you'll definitely see there's the theme running here in what we're talking about today. And I'll also look at some of the obstacles that we faced and the things that you need to think about to overcome it. So there's two projects that I will uh, reference. One is our teacher professional development online initiative, no, teacher online professional development initiative, which is Top D, which we ran earlier this year for government school teachers. So we gave government school teachers Pan India the opportunity to take a six-week My English course. So we found the right level for them. So it was to help them improve their English language skills. But we also included a focus um, separately on looking at the methodology of the course and helping them think about their methodology in the classroom and what they could take away from their experience as a learner. Um, I'll also be mentioning the Andhra Pradesh project. So we work with 85,000 learners in Andhra Pradesh at the moment in conjunction with the government. And that's a blended approach as well. The blend there is self-access courses and it's face-to-face -face tuition to improve the English language skills of college students across AP. So um, I'm going to skip that. Um, so let's walk into the success factors. Now, 
Before I talk about this, I want to stress that technology is not a methodology. It's not a pedagogy, it's a tool. And like any tool, like the pen and paper, slates, papyrus, it's about how you harness that tool effectively. So these success factors are actually applicable to education in general. Um, but if you harness technology, it's an amazing tool because it gives you scalability, it gives you reach, it gives you flexibility. So it's, it is very exciting, but it still is a tool. How you use it is very important. So first of all, you've got to think about content and approach. So is the content relevant to the learners? Has the content been designed to be high quality? Is it designed not just by subject matter experts? Is it designed by people who know how teaching and learning and the learning process works? Is the content practical? Does it have something that you can take from the classroom into the real world? Is the content interactive? Is it fun? Is it engaging? If we're engaged and we have fun when we're learning, we learn better. Okay, and what about your approach? So I spoke about the blended approach. So there's two things that I mentioned. One was asynchronous and one was synchronous. Now, you adopt asynchronous and synchronous where it's suitable, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but asynchronous is the self-access um, side of the courses. So that's where learners go and engage the material in their own time to the extent that they want. And that's the important thing, is that learners get to decide, I want to do this exercise over and over again. I want to try that. And they're not in lockstep with the rest of the class. They're not getting left behind or racing too far ahead because they're accessing it in their own time, and it's flexible. And then on the synchronous side, what are you doing um, to bring people together? How are you socializing the people together? How are the teachers or the trainers facilitating learning? So one important uh, thing to think about, and this is going to have real impact, um, increasingly so in, in countries like the States, this is how the classroom is organized. Some of you will have heard of the flipped classroom. Okay, so, in a, so we've got the triangle in the middle here. This is Bloom's taxonomy. This is learning, the learning process. And we start at the bottom with what we could look at as lower order thinking skills. And we move through those to higher order thinking skills. Now, in a traditional classroom, we spend time on these lower order thinking skills. So we spend time introducing and doing the very sort of simple practice. Now, I would argue those are the skills that are easier for us to, to engage with and to do on our own. And those are the things that we don't need as much help with. But then we send our students away with homework. Go and take this and apply it. And we send them off on their own at, for something that's more complex where they would need someone to help them and to facilitate them. So in a flipped classroom, you turn it on its head. So the individual work happens first. So that could be something in the style of Khan Academy, for example, watching a video. And then coming into the classroom work where your teacher is not your lecturer, your teacher is your guide and your facilitator. And your teacher helps you to really get into the meaty things like analyzing, evaluating, synthesizing that learning so you can be creative. In my case, this is being able to uh, take what you learn in English and go out into the world and use something you've learned here to do something else. So it's important that we think about the flipped classroom as an approach. Um, the approach that we use as well in our language courses is communicative. And that is the, the, the theme that runs through whatever we do, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. It's all about being communicative. And uh, that kind of jumps me to the third point there, which is the real-life applicability. There's no point learning lots of theory if you can't go out into the real world and use it. 
Okay, and then I'll talk about facilitators. So I'm saying facilitators, not teachers or trainers or moderators, because that is the role. Now, I'm very glad to say that I don't think that teaching as a job is in danger. Other jobs might be with automation, but I don't think it's in danger, but it has to change. And what we see as the teacher's role is more of a facilitator's role. And that could be either if you're directly engaged with online uh, teaching, as we are, or it could be if you have a course where your students are expected to go and do something online, and you have to then facilitate the work that matches that. So what's really important with facilitators is all about their training, their initial training. So it could be formal. We have qualifications, for example, of all of our teachers have e-moderator qualifications. But it could also be in terms of how you upskill your teachers. Now, for example, all of our teachers learned how to be an e-moderator by taking an online course. So they have the experience of the other side. What's it like to be a student on the online course? They've learned how to troubleshoot, how to find, um, how to do things. They've got confidence. Now, a lot of things don't work when teachers don't have confidence in what they're doing and they don't have faith, they don't have belief because they're scared or because they're not positive about it. So it's about training. It's about helping um, people become good facilitators because they understand the online learning experience. And it's about continuing professional development all the way through you have to have a system where you're professionally developing your teachers. Okay, I'm going to jump to number four because I mentioned number three, soft skills training. Now, um, I think it's the role of any educator now, and we've had 21st century skills mentioned a couple of times, which is fantastic because I'm going to get into that. So here we have our 21st century or our core skills. So it's not just about learning about a subject now, it's about learning um, about that subject within a greater framework, and that's our 21st century or core skills. So first of all, there's critical thinking. You'll remember that Bloom's taxonomy, and we get into evaluating and analyzing. That's critical thinking skills. These are the skills that we're going to need to future-proof our workforce. These are the things that, that people will need in the future that we need to, oh, sorry, <laughs> that we need to adopt as, uh, as digital immigrants and that our digital natives need to be motivated and encouraged to bring out. Collaboration and teamwork is really important, but how do we do that in an online mode? Well, you, you create peer networks, you encourage peer learning, we have a lot of pair and a lot of group work in our, in our classes because we then have people who are learning how to work remotely with each other across, um, across the digital divide. Creativity, um, I'm not going to talk much about creativity, I think Syed has uh, said a lot for us, um, but it's important that people are creative with what they learn and they're able to go and take it out and be entrepreneurial with it, for example. Um, information and digital, oh sorry, global and cultural awareness. It's a globalized society. We're looking at a workforce that needs to be able to work um, with people from all over. Information and digital literacy. Now, uh, oh well, already. <laughs> information and digital literacy <clears throat> is the key of, of what we do. And by bringing in our digital elements, we need to understand that we need to increase the digital literacy and independent learning. So beyond whatever interaction you do, so for example, My English is a six-week course. One thing that we do is we look at independent learning and how do we encourage people to self-manage and to manage their time? And these are essential things for online learning. Okay, so that was the soft skills. So focus on autonomy beyond any interaction, how do we train our learners to be better learners in and of themselves? What skills can we give them in the courses that we teach 
so that they have a lifelong ability to be autonomous learners. It's essential. And evaluation and feedback. So giving uh, progress reports, for example, that we do on our courses, um, individual feedback are all super important because people need to know their areas for improvement, but also their strengths. They need to be motivated. Where do you go next? What's your individual learning plan? What, what can you do? And where do you need to go? Okay. What are the obstacles? Number one is onboarding people. Um, so if you've got a purely online course, people are still a little suspicious. We're still at that sort of crux point where online learning is not seen as good as face-to-face -face learning. I would argue that the outcomes are the same, if not better. Um, also, there's a fear because it's technology. What am I going to do? Am I going to get it wrong? Um, so technology I'll talk about in a minute, but getting people on board and taking advantage of the networks people have. When we did Top D, for example, we used uh, their government contacts and their WhatsApp groups were really important in getting people on board. Attrition. So online courses have greater attrition than face-to-face -face courses. It's a fact. MOOCs have up to 90% attrition. Um, why is there attrition? Well, it's motivation. So people need to, to be more motivated in an online course. I mentioned self and time management. We're very overt in our courses about how to manage your time and manage yourself and manage your learning. And we, you're going to have to communicate a lot more with the people that you work with to encourage them and motivate them and keep them on board. It's much easier to procrastinate in front of a computer than it is in a, in a classroom. Obviously, in a classroom, you don't know if somebody's checked out or if they're paying attention. On an online course, it becomes very obvious. And finally, technology. Two areas. One is infrastructure. So it's access to technology. So mobile-friendly solutions are incredibly important, and they're going to be the, the number one way that, that people will be accessing. Stuff that works on low bandwidth, things that can be downloaded, assisting people with access to technology in schools, in the workplace, so that they can spend time studying, and technological skills. Take nothing for granted. On the AP project, we had to help students get email addresses. It wasn't enough just to help them get email addresses. We also had to teach them email etiquette, like check it. Check your spam box. So don't assume... But what online gives our learners is eventually, after just a few weeks, they have all these amazing online skills. And you see people at the start of, of a course who, who've never used video conferencing before, very confidently at the end, engaging with people all over through video conferencing. So these are the three very key obstacles. So what's, just to recap, and I'll just let you read through this. This is what we found is our toolkit for success with the courses that we do um, that gets us um, very high learning scores. Most of our projects, 90% or over the learning scores that we get. Um, but it's about providing... Okay, it's about providing the right people, the right content, the right mix and the right balance. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Beth. And uh, we are uh, come to, the, to our final speaker. In many ways, we have saved our best for last. So I would encourage uh, all of you to, unless you absolutely have to leave for a bio break, please stay. So bookending our array of uh, interesting speakers today is what I would call a homegrown gem and a dear friend. Madan Padaki. Madan is part of the Rotarian family. He was a Rotaractor in his early days. He's an engineer, a serial social entrepreneur. He's received several sustainable and scalable social enterprises uh, that he's empowered. Uh, he believes in job creation rather than job seeking. Uh, to know Madan is to know about organizations such as the Head Held High, Ruben Bridge, Make India Capable, Global Action on Poverty, Million, Dollar, Million Jobs Mission. I can keep going on, Madan. 
but I'll be taking up your time. So he's a much sought after speaker. Uh, for an overachiever, you'll realize this very soon, his lack of hubris and uh, uh, you know, just down um, you know, uh, infectious charm are truly endearing. So take it away, Madan. And sorry to have, somebody had to go last. And Hi, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Ram, for a very kind introduction. Uh, I just want you to remember this number as we get into the talk. This number can either make or mar our country. And this number is what keeps me awake at night. And as Dr. Kalam said, you know, dreams are not something that you do well asleep in the night, but something that keeps you awake through the day and through the night. This number is what keeps me awake, dreaming of a better future. And I'll come back to this number shortly. Somebody said uh, a quote about education, defined education in the most beautiful way, and that stayed with me for years. Education was defined as nothing but a motivated learner, an inspired teacher, and a tree. And a tree is a metaphor for all the technology, for all the blackboards, all the whiteboards, everything that we can use. But if that tree does not inspire the teacher or motivate the learner, we don't get the outcomes that we want. And that to me is the critical difference that we as educators need to think about. That how do you create an environment where you can motivate the learner and inspire the teacher? And we've had several wonderful examples in the last few talks. I also believe, uh, just summarizing maybe in my mind, I was thinking of the shifts that we're seeing in education, that there are five fundamental shifts that I believe is happening, has to happen. One, it's not about education, it's about learning. Two, it's not about learning, it's about skills. Three, it's just not about skills, it's about jobs. Four, it is just not about jobs, it's about job creation. And fifth, it's just not about job creation, it's about change making. Right. And what I want to do over the next few 10-15 uh, minutes is to give you some examples of my transformation that I have seen some of these examples playing out, and I will ask the question, if it can happen in one, why can't it happen in millions? Or how do we make it happen in millions? The first transformation uh, that I saw came out about 20, 10 years ago when I started, the, when we co-founded the Headed High Foundation. I was running this company called Meritrack. We were one of the first skills assessment entity in India. Uh, we had scaled by 20, 2007. We had assessed millions of graduates and employability. My worldview is some people were employable, some were not, and that's the way the world is. Till such time that a Rutanian, uh, Sunil Savara and Rajesh Bhatt came, came to me saying that, hey, we're planning something crazy. Would you be a part of it? I said, how crazy is it? He said, hey, we plan to set up a rural BPO, and we want to take quite literally village youth to do BPO jobs. I said, this is as crazy as it can get because I was assessing kids for BPO in Bangalore and I said, you know, the average strike rate is 8%. How will you ever run a BPO in a rural setting by using village youth? It's impossible. But one part of me, one tiny part of me said, hey, what if this is possible? What, what can we learn from this experiment? And that's how this experiment of taking quite literally a zero educated illiterate village youth uh, with absolutely no schooling, and we said, can this guy trans be transformed into an English-speaking computer literate knowledge professional? And the results changed my life. I'll just play a, a, I usually play this video often. I want to play it again. I'm sure many of you have seen some of these very briefly. This is Ramesh. Comes from a village called Koti Gudda in Raichur, about 60 kilometers from Raichur, back of the beyond. Never stepped out of his village, never been to school, never held a pencil in his life. 18 years of age or so, he says, there's no birth, date of birth, evidence. First day of training, the video is horrible because we never knew what we were getting into. Uh, family of 10 lives on an unable two-acre land. The entire family pulls together 3,000 rupees a month. Family put together. When Ramesh joined our program, all he's saying in this video is his brother's name, sister's name. He's not even able to string a sentence together in Canada. Eight kids like Ramesh signed up for our uh, experiment. We put them up in a house in Bangalore, hired a BPO trainer saying, hey, eight, however time, you can take a year or two years, get them to work in the BPO. The trainer vanishes during lunchtime. He says, are you out of your mind? I can't train kids in 
Joseph's here to, to be in the BPO world. How can you expect me to do these, uh, to work on these kids? Sunil, my friends, all of them started living with these kids six, seven months, almost 18 hours a day. It was so immersive that in the night when these kids used to sleep, you used to be the, leave the BBC radio on so that the immersion is complete. And what happened at the end of seven months not only transformed their lives, transformed mine, because I said how wrong we are in badging people as employable, not employable. This is the same Ramesh after seven Ramesh months. Mabrachur. When I was in my village, I did not know how to write even my name in Canada. In my village, I always wore dhoti. I never traveled on the bus. I did not know what's the time and what's the watch. I knew only two things, go to farm or sunrise, came back home or sunset. I had never visited a city. I did not know about city life. When I first came to Bangalore, I could not speak to anyone. And I also scared to touch a computer. When I started to learn in English, I was so scared because I did not know how to write everything. After the seven months, I can type minimum at 40 words per minute. A month ago, I went to my village for my brother's wedding. My mother told me, please sir, come and have a seat. She did not recognize me. She asked, who are you? I told her, I am Ramesh, your son. As she did believe. Then I showed my ID card on which earlier photo was there. She looked at the photo for a while and argued. And after the every moment, she cried with the tears of happiness. I never can forget that experience. Thank you. Not just Ramesh. Seven others with them transformed like this. We have now touched about 6,000 kids across the country. We run centers in 40 uh, rural areas across seven states. And every case, I see transformation happening. Right? If you take Ramesh on a scale of 1 to 10 at 10, I easily see seven happening almost everywhere. And a few of them escape to read that 10. What is the magic behind this? And I... I, I when I met Professor Yunus many years ago, he said something beautiful which struck to me. He said, a lot of us die without knowing what treasures lie within. And I resonate to what Professor Amartya Sen said about poverty, that poverty is nothing but capability deprivation and opportunity deprivation. Right? I believe that everybody has immense unlimited potential. It is just that some get a capability platform to express it, schools, colleges or whatever, attending a RILA, right? And some don't. How do we create that opportunity? And it's just not that this stops here. And I don't use the word training because training is a, is a, is a two-way street. You get trained, you forget it, you become something. It's transformation because a Ramesh after can never ever become Ramesh before again. It is a one-way street. Uh, four years later, and I want to show the transformation. 20, this is 2007. 2011, uh, we won the CNN IBM Real Heroes Award for this. Ramesh was on stage to receive it. You can see the same guy four years Ramesh, later receiving this award. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Four years ago, I had never thought of getting out of my, my village. Today, I am on national TV. I am very happy to be here with all of you. Four years ago, I didn't know how to write my name in any language. Today, I am working in a BPO company as a team leader. My dream is to get a, give an opportunity to all the villagers like me. And when he talks about the dream, today he is living the dream. Five years fast forwarded, he worked in a BPO, ran a team of 20. It was ironical that one of India's largest outsourcing companies, we were running HR exits for them. So it was ironical that when a graduate in Gurgaon quit this company in, uh, in Delhi, the termination letter used to be sent by a zero educated villager from Koppal. Right? <laughs> Uh, Ramesh today has gone back to his village, is a motivational speaker, has addressed over 2,75,000 students across North Karnataka telling kids that if I can become like this, imagine your potential. Right? So he's become the change maker that I envisage uh, people to be. How does this happen? I believe everything and one of the words, I think that's the most important word, we heard references to this uh, in the last hour, uh, is aspiration. It has to stem from the heart. You can't superimpose education just because I think you have to get educated. You have to come from the heart of saying, who do you want to be? And how can we help you do that? Right? And aspiration resides everywhere. In all the kids I've met, I've just done snippets. So I used to go around saying, hey, what do you want to be? 
an interesting video just a 10 minutes police inspector teacher auditor contractor businessman these are all our tradies you you will see the interesting one auditor right about a fourth standard kid in uh, in koppal who said i want to be an auditor i asked him so how did you know what this is he said i don't know i was sitting in a bus i met a guy uh, who was sitting next to me i asked him what do you do he said i ask questions to banks so apparently he was going to audit the bank a chartered accountant he said that's interesting all the banks ask me questions i want to be somebody who will ask questions to banks right and that's how he said i want to be an auditor right so imagine that it doesn't matter who you are today with the exposure there is aspirations of being somebody in everybody's heart i have never met a person who says who doesn't have an aspiration in their heart right how do we leverage that so each of our kids when we come into our program we say you know what you are here to lead your dreams how can we help you uh, capture your aspirations that becomes the start point what does that lead to it leads to fun how do we make learning we make learning fun there is no classroom nobody sitting and teaching let me teach you a b c d in fact we don't believe in english in that sense a lot of our kids tell us oh what will make you get confidence if i speak english and if i type if i know how to use the computer i am confident so we'll say we teach you english without any grammar it doesn't matter right we just need you to communicate and be understood and we need you to know what a computer is and say i have an email id that's good enough that unlocks your uh, confidence right so just again a uh, 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 video clipping from many years ago uh, just third day oh, I we can move family chipama today third day of training kids who have never spoken english both of them are fourth standard third standard dropouts having okay. fun learning uh, english dancing. and learning okay. Okay. okay how to have fun sangeet okay and maruti and anvesh dancing okay. now what Now it's a start. Yes. 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 Y
now i wear formal dress always and uh, one time before i went to adult life one time i went to uh, tea shop the shopkeeper uh, said uh, what is come and sit there is water is there you took you take that day i am very same one. but when i completed uh, my adult life training training then i went to one more again one more again i that shop that day shopkeeper is uh, said come sir sit sir what do you want sir okay kim takes a uh, water uh, this is very good uh, this is speaking with this spoke with me furious that i am very happy so i completed my uh, drink that respect that 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 confidence to say i can now deal with the world in my own terms and i know how to command that dignity to me is the most important part of any education process uh sorry, if you can just move to the next one please i'll come back to the to the 120 million jobs that we need job creators we don't need people who stand in a queue waiting for a for a job to appear we have several examples of kids who have gone back to the villages to set up grocery stores to be on their own in one bridge we have now enabled about 600 odd youth across villages to do assisted commerce various activities in the villages where they start delivering stuff uh, to their communities and i believe that if we can create 10 to 15 million entrepreneurs in the village level mass entrepreneurs who can then create 5 to 10 jobs each we have solved the 120 million issue of youth entering the workforce and from there you use the launch pad to get them to become change makers how do you solve local challenges by having people take responsibility almost i envision a rotary club in every village how do we have a group of entrepreneurs who are seized with the issue of saying let me solve local problems in a way that i can do good feel good and make good money and i believe there's an intersection that resides there and this intersection we're calling it as as rubenomics we're saying that if you add talent entrepreneurial spirit aspirations and technology the rural that we envisage is no longer the old rural it's a new rural that we call as rubens and we are pursuing a model of rubenomics where we believe that if we bring these elements together to play on the ground by bringing these aspects together you can change the face of india right so these are the various initiatives that i do we have head life foundation where we transform people we have uh, entrepreneur awakening through an initiative called antar prerna play on the word entrepreneur a uh, gap which is about em- enabling change makers and one bridge which is about creating opportunity platforms for entrepreneurs on the ground to eradicate poverty i believe that conversations like this will make the beautiful poem written by our national poet guru rabindranath tagore come true where the mind is without fear the head is held high where knowledge is free where Where, where, the, where the world is not broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depths of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Jai Hind. I did promise uh, a variety of. speakers and uh, thought processes uh, we've come to the segment where we've got to ask all five of them to kindly come up to the stage and to moderate a brief discussion answer some of your questions uh, what we'd like to do is uh, introduce a fellow rotarian a fellow senior rotarian of mine uh, from this very district satish madhavan uh, he's the district club service director this year Uh, Satish will be moderating the panel, and um, you know you'll find that he's a warm and gregarious person. Um, he he have obviously paid me to say that nice words about him. Um, his work has uh, entailed extensive travel, right, Satish? I could keep on, uh, but he's basically in the fashion business and um, in the in the export uh, of uh, garments, uh, merchandising. He's also, in addition to that. he's a frequent speaker at fashion institutes around the world now that's very interesting and um, he offered to moderate this panel so i'm delighted and i'm also happy that i'm almost coming to the end of my term here in front of the mic so i'm going to hand it over to you congrats good evening good evening after these wonderful speakers i don't think you know i mean we should have more energy right yeah. 
So let's give the speakers a big round of applause. Personally, I think this has been uh, one of the best uh, sessions that I've had where I could listen to five great speakers, understand supporting education from different perspectives, but all leading to the same goal. Uh, I would like to invite our speakers back on stage uh, so that you know, there are a lot of questions from the audience and uh, you could throw some light on their questions. Shekhaji, <coughs> Madan, Sai. Yeah, yeah, come, come, come. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, friends, so this is just uh, going to be a 30 minute session. So maybe we, we may not be able to take all your questions. We'll try and cover as much as possible. And uh, I'm just going to read out. Uh, OK, we'll start with uh, our Rotary PRID, Shekhar Mehtaji. This is for you. Uh, as part of the literacy mission, what is being done to make our schools more inclusive where the children with learning disability and other disorders are also allowed to go to school and learn? So we are aware of this and we are working towards that. The teacher training program, there are uh, some volunteers from Rotary family itself who are uh, volunteering to train on how to deal with such children. They are trying to train the teachers and how to deal with them. At the same time, when we are ensuring to make those schools happy schools, we are ensuring that every aspect for a let's say a challenged child is uh, uh, being taken care of. So these are the two aspects. One is uh, sensitizing the teacher and the other is creating the infrastructure for such children. The rest, the right to education does say that it has to be inclusive education in any case. Thank you. Thank you, Shekhaji. And uh, let's move on to Professor Piri uh, This question is for you from Sujata Radhakrishna. <coughs> How can digital immigrants like us uh, fester and facilitate the digital nature of today? Foster, it should be foster, not fester. Digital I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Digital is festering our lives, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think uh, the most important thing is to really have an open mindset. and. Uh, you know, Syed, you said something. I just want to connect to that because, you know, I wanted to make that point. I didn't really make it uh, for <coughs> because I got a little pressured for time. See, we tend to kind of think in very traditional terms. For instance, all of learning is a black and white in textbooks and so on. But all the media that we consume, everything that we consume is in media today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a young child, they give a phone and they click pictures and videos and so on. So, they're naturally there. I think. For me, the biggest learning is from my kids. I just look at them and they tell me what to do. They are far more ahead of me. Uh, so so the, the point I'm trying to make is it's a willingness to learn, openness, uh, willingness to experiment. And uh, I think occasionally willingness to say that, well, this didn't work, and then let me try something else. Uh, so a lack of fear about failure, I, I think, really helps. I don't know whether that answers right. the question, but. Right, okay, so uh, when we mean digital natives, I think everybody is into the digital world today and uh, if you see, uh, not everybody is probably learning what they need to be learning. Uh, so I think there's a downside to this entire uh, narrative that is happening. So that's a different topic altogether, I know. <coughs> so this, yeah. I think that point also was made because most often digital initiatives fail because they're seen as an add-on. Yeah. You take a cart and fix a rocket to it, how will it work? It will not work. Yeah. And that is really the problem. So I think you have to look at as technology is blended and adapted. And then you know, there, there is a possibility of success there. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jos. This uh, question is for uh, Sultan. Uh, this is from Thank you, sir. Uh, Sheila Pichet. <coughs> Can the government school have some movies shown to them, like 
like the one from you, the government schools. Yes, so when we originally started off the school cinema program, the idea was for it to, I didn't know it would be successful, right? And that would, would work. Uh, I have worked with government schools in the past and what I've realized is that if you want to introduce any program for the governments, you better make it successful in the private schools and then the government's willing to listen. I think today we are now very well positioned and we're working on two levels. In one <coughs> hand, uh, going down and uh, you know, meeting up with a couple of uh, governments across the country to see if we can uh, translate these films into the local languages. They're very re the medium is very relevant, but some of our most of our films are made for middle class children. Right? So, for example, the challenge of a middle caste children is to live up to the expectations of the parents and, you know, trying to get those 99% marks. Whereas a lot of children in the rural part of the country have a problem where uh, the, they're not even encouraged to go to school. So, you can't show the same film. The medium is relevant. Uh, some issues are universal. We'll need to adapt it for the government. In fact, we are also in talks with Saudi Arabia. If we've all been hearing about Saudi Arabia opening up its, uh, you know, entertainment caution, and and we are trying to, uh, you know, make inroads to see if we can create Arabic content for the Arab world because the medium and the format is very relevant. Thank you, uh, Sultan. Uh, I would like to add something. Yeah. So one of the plus things of my coming here was to listen to these speakers. And Sultan, like you said, you wanted to speak to me equally. I want to speak to you. We now will have access to 150,000 schools. Wow. Uh, where there is going to be digital format of learning. Yeah. Perfect medium for you to Absolutely. show the films wherever you would like to. Absolutely. I think that's a yeah. great Fantastic. Place, a great meeting. Place. I think that's some great synergy, you know, that can work. Yeah. Uh, right. Thank you, Sultan. And uh, Beth, this is for you. <coughs> How do you ensure your learners become autonomous, autonomous learners? Great question. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's lots of things to do. It's about being really overt with um, learner training. So we include um, small bursts of learner training. So um, in English language speaking um, learning, then it, it might be anything from really understanding how to use a dictionary and get the most out of a dictionary. Um, in order to, you know, for pronunciation or whatever, or it could be about managing your study time, it could be about how to um, judge uh, critically how good a website is for learning and the learning content. So all of these things you have to be very overt and you have to give really practical examples to get people to um, learn how to learn and how to learn well. And we get our students to reflect on it as well, so we get them to tell us what strategies work. Is there some kind of feedback that you have, uh, a feedback mechanism from the students? Yeah, I mean, part of what we do is getting people to go away and try things, because it's not a one-size-fits-all as well. We all learn differently, sure. and there are different things that work for us. So we get them to go away and try some things and come back and say, okay, this worked for me, or I've been doing the course and I've discovered actually that this is working for me as a strategy. And we get them to also reflect on, at the end of the course, what's next for them? Where are they gonna go? What's their individual learning plan? What have they learned? And where, and where are they gonna go and find that information? So it's important to, to structure it around the individual and to be very overt about it. Thank you, Beth. Uh, <coughs> Shekharji, there's another question for you from Sujata Vivek. Uh, what are the challenges faced while collecting feedback about teachers from the students? That's a nation builder uh, award. Yeah, uh, it, it's not really difficult. The children, so we tell the volunteers, uh, don't ask the questions in front of the teachers. Just befriend the student and the student will normally be happy to answer. The questions are very simply asked. So the language, if you, uh, I think the questionnaire is on the website, uh, rotaryteach.org, if you go there in the teacher uh, support section. Uh, the questions asked are so simple that the child would give a very natural answer to it. So it's, uh, there's no inhibition for the child to give the answer. So we don't really find difficulty in getting the answers. Yeah, it's, since it's about, you know, uh, giving an opinion about their own teachers, which our schools are not used to, you know, probably that is what the question is being directed at. So they don't give an opinion about the teacher? So 
let's say there are five teachers you ask them uh, does this teacher do this for you or not so they say yes or no i mean does the teacher help you after school hours if you need so they'll say yes or no so you get the answer and you can understand what the teacher how uh, proactive the teacher is in this aspect or that yeah i, I can totally relate to this because we've done uh, this ourselves in our club so Every time we go to a school, it's not really difficult. It's quite easy, and uh, we've identified some great teachers in the process, right? And uh, Professor Jose uh, <coughs> from Vikram, with good infrastructure, technology, what is the one aspect where the lecturer brings interest in the subject he or she is teaching? Okay, I think it's not infrastructure, or I don't think, I think it's just passion that a person has to teach. You must love the subject that you teach. Otherwise, no matter what uh, props you have, you cannot teach, and you will not be effective. And in a class, people sense it very, very quickly. Uh, so that is the first thing. I mean, you must be passionate. And I think technology is just a kind of, you know, some kind of help, because in, in the digital medium, of course, you know, people sometimes do really fancy work uh, with very expensive equipment and so on. But some of the most popular videos, the Khan Academy videos that I showed you, are just done very simply. Uh, so. It is not the prop, it is the passion that I think uh, really drives it. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, the next question is for Madan. Uh, Madan, uh, how many girls take part in your training on the rural segment which we are talking about? I think. No, it's been an interesting uh, journey. Typically, we have about 25%. So, in a batch of 20, 24, you will have about six, seven girls in the classroom. Right. Uh, in many of the rural areas, we are the first. Uh, entity that does a co-ed class. And it's fascinating to watch what the boys learn from the girls and girls learn from the boys. There's a lot more appreciation of each other. Uh, in some cases, we have tried, attempted to do a girls only batch. In Gulbarga, we've actually run three girls only batches. Okay. Uh, our target is to get to a 50-50 uh, thing. It's very hard because to convince uh, parents to <coughs> send their girls for residential programs is difficult. So in some cases, we actually moved them to a non-residential. Uh, but we are doing a very interesting experiment on the entrepreneur side. Out of the 650 entrepreneurs that we have across 1,000 villages in Karnataka, we have 300 women and 350 uh, men. Uh, we are attempting a model where every village will have one male and a one female entrepreneur because we believe that it is that combination that will unlock abundance for the village, not one alone. And we are trying to figure out how do you team them up in such a way uh, that you are able to uh, talk to everybody in the village and that's our stated goal to get to a 50-50 uh, goal on, as far as entrepreneurs in, in rural are concerned. Normally girls do better than boys in most uh, exams. We see that in every batch. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> we see that in every batch. So all the girls, I think you deserve In fact, uh, we see that in the villages of the entrepreneurs as well. Uh, our daily active, uh, we manage daily, we look at daily activity levels. Uh, the women, our daily activity levels are between 95 to 97 percent. The men are around 70 percent. Right. So we see that okay. everywhere. You know, I, I have an interesting uh, point to make on that. Uh, it's a big debate in a lot of West European and very uh, advanced countries, where uh, where I think uh, the debate is around if given an equal opportunity, our education system, the way it's designed, is going to is it favors the the fairer sex. Right, it favors women. So internationally, for uh, keeping the next couple of decades in mind, the MIT runs a program called Solve, which mm. is, uh, you know, problems of the future. One of the issues that's being deliberated is how do we tweak our educational system for the future so that when women start or the girls start getting equal opportunities, they will start getting the lion's share yeah. of. Uh, you know, the benefits of the education. So how do we, uh, the future is going to be, how are we going to take care of our boys? boys. So <laughs> <laughs> no, on that uh, thing, I must, I must share this. This was fascinating. A few years ago, I had a CEO, a friend of mine who is a CEO of a large company, attend uh, to come to one of our centers in uh, Tumkur. And he was interacting with, uh, with the class and he asked one of the girls, so what do you want to be? So she looked at him and said, I want to be the CEO. I want to be a CEO. So this guy made the mistake of asking which company? <laughs> she looked straight at him and said, why not your company? <laughs> and he was shocked. He said, this is the first time anybody is challenging me for my job right in front of me, right? He said, I've never heard it even in the US. I think that's the confidence that, 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 that's so beautiful to see. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Shekharji, this is again for you. Is there a program where we are looking at a K-12 curriculum, especially around moral science and civic sense, teach children how to be good citizens? So, uh, I'm so happy somebody asked this question to me. Uh, I mean, I always, to my own children, I never said get grades. You don't have to be first five in the class. It's a different thing. They did that. Maybe because of that, I never expected, I didn't want to tell that to them. But my only thing to them was become better human being. I think we stop moral science classes up to class five, if at all. I think this, the, what needs to be taught, and I would not say uh, anywhere in the world, is right up to any age, actually. And what you said, we need to have people who learn to live life and behave well. You have to be better citizens of the country. And we are very interested in getting these modules into the videos that the, the, uh, the content that we are going to give. We are going to, for example, today I find we can use so much content from him. Now, we would want somebody who is developing content on such issues Translating them into different languages, we'll be able to get that done. That's not a problem. Uh, so if we get ready content available, uh, it'll be the best thing that we can do. I am so interested that this becomes a very important part of the curriculum. It's so very, very important. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to share with you. I was a part of the Chintan Shiver of the HRD ministry. Uh, the NCRT has brought down the curriculum by 50%, and that's the talk that's going on. So what are they going to do for the 50% was, was the Chintan Shiver all about. Five areas will be of focus for Indian schools going forward. Uh, it's going to be value education, life skills education, experiential learning, it's digital technology, and I think there's one more, the five sport. So there are going to be five areas. That's where children are going to be spending a lot more time. Uh, on paper, it sounds outstanding. Uh, like yoga was introduced in Indian schools. I hope this doesn't go down the same way. But on paper, I think it's fantastic that we're going to focus on this. No, but they've got sports introduced well. Uh, the, the sports program has taken off well. And I'm sure that's going to stay because the children are going to love that yeah. in any case. Beth, uh, this is for you. Of course, it's from KS Ravichandran. Flexibility in le learning, make it interesting, enjoy while you learn, putting the learning to effective use uh, for improvement, tips for improvement. Okay, I'm not quite sure I understand the yeah, question. Yeah, even I, I, I really don't understand the question, but I think, <laughs> I think is uh, Ravichandran here? Yeah. Yeah, do you want to ask it yourself? W w was this a suggestion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's what we're all working towards now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Anyway, so I think we'll let that pass. Again, uh, Professor Jones, I think you're a very popular, uh, you know, home person ground, here. Yeah. yeah, home ground. You know, you're playing the home <laughs> home wicket now. I'm I'm getting uh, you know a lot of uh, requests. Um, education has become more of a commercial rather than activity rather than knowledge sharing. Teachers need to upgrade and keep up with the changes in curriculum. What needs to be done to change this? I think the answer came, I think, in your presentation itself. Yeah. Uh, and you said that we must respect teachers more. I think we must. And this is not just a cliched statement. Uh, respect also manifests in multiple ways in the way we not just compensate, I'm not referring to compensation alone, that's the point that I made earlier, but you can look at the way you recruit teachers. You know, the fact, the, uh, it's, a, it's a fact that if you can make it to a good BPO, then you would not become a teacher. So, because I interact with a lot of schools and I see that, you know, people who, who could not make it to BPO have actually made it as teachers. Now, this is so much in contrast with, if you consider Finland, which is one of the best education systems, they tell you that it's easier becoming a surgeon than becoming a teacher. There are several stages through you, which you go through, you've got to be qualified. It's not just Finland, Israel. Uh, it's exactly the same system. You have to go continuously, uh, you know, be kind of uh, trained, retrained. I was just sitting in a meeting just, um, you know, a couple of days ago. There was someone from Israel who actually pointed out that 
you know, in the context of MOOCs, they were saying, teachers are expected to do MOOCs. That's their way of reaching out and training them. Once they, only if they do that, the increment really comes into, you know, is given. So we have kind of uh, made teaching a side profession. And in a way, very crudely put, a side -y kind of profession. And therefore, you know, uh, you know we, have a, we have a problem. And I think the other part also, uh, we've put so much emphasis on, uh, you know, brands and so on. And so on the other hand, this, this unfortunately has become a business. So my wife is a teacher and therefore I feel very strongly about that too. Uh, but you know, I have heard of students um, standing up in class and telling a teacher <coughs> that we pay your salary. And this is not so uncommon in Bangalore, right? And I can remember the time when I was a kid in school, if you got, you know, a, you know, kind of a slap in school, you never s mentioned that at home because you got one more. Uh, but today, you would have parents who would come and say, I'm not for you know, physical punishment, but they would ask you, why are you kind of correcting my child? So this is a serious issue. So I think, you know, you know the, the main problem is we need to really educate parents. I think that's really the problem. Uh, because that parents are not well educated. Yeah. But you know, the, yeah. the, the flip side of what you said also I experienced. For me, you know, in my house the problem is not that, uh, you know, my children live up to my expectations, I'm middle class. I have to live up to their expectations. <laughs> and that is also a big challenge. But that aside, you know, I think we have to raise the profile of teaching in this country. We have to get the best people to teach. We have to compensate them. We have to respect them and we should not turn education into a business enterprise. But please, I'm not saying that, you know, education should be run as charity. I said even charity needs to be world class. World class needs to be, you know, financially viable. So I'm not anyway suggesting that you kind of bring down the standards or bring down the cost or don't compensate or don't allow private enterprises to enter into education. All I'm saying is quality needs to be controlled, monitored, and uh, we need to work around the system. Our system is really very badly broken, whether we like it or not. I mean, that's a reality. One more, one more question can I, for sorry, you. Sorry, yeah. I, I just yeah, wanted please. to add something onto here and something that hasn't been mentioned necessarily is teachers' CPD. And it's about school leadership recognizing the importance of CPD for teachers. It's about the prominence that it's given. It's about the quality of the CPD. So I talk to a lot of teachers in government schools who really want to learn and are really passionate, but they're not being given the right sort of learning and they're not being given the right support to carry on that learning. It's not just go off and do a MOOC, is it? It's, it's how, you, how you build that in to their, their roles and their jobs. You don't expect them to go off on Saturdays and Sundays and spend their free time doing it. So I think CPD is also a really important area. Just a quick, uh, also follow up to that. Sometimes we assume that uh, you know, school education is really bad. But the fact of the matter is if you look at higher education also, it's equally worse. badly managed. It's worse. Take MBA schools. There are 4,000 MBA schools in this country. Most are run by part-time faculty, by part-time uh, you know, everything is part-time, everything is on hire, everything is on rent and so on, except the students. Uh, you know, and that's the model that a lot of higher education institutions work. It's equally dismal even there. So. Right. <coughs> One quick question uh, on, uh, from uh, Ananta Bhatt. How soon can we see foreign universities in India, the likes of Stanford, Oxford? What are the trends in this direction? So the quick short answer to that is they're already here. Uh, and they are actually uh, offering courses. Uh, particularly in the MOOC space, you find that, just to give one simple example, MIT has a course in supply chain management, um, and that's $60,000 one year in MIT, you know, at MIT. You can do half of that course for $1,000, and then apply to MIT, and you can get admission there directly. I, I think, uh, I think know, Pro Professor Jones, what he meant is that universities such as Stanford and Oxford, yeah. the same standard, I'm, no, I'm saying exactly the okay. same course. In fact, uh, you know, Georgetown University, uh, Masters in Computer Science, $10,000, exactly the same certificate, the same alumni uh, status, the same privileges. So, you know, the point is that we kind of, we kind of, you know, barricaded ourselves. You know, we, we put boundaries, uh, political boundaries around educational institutions. Now, technology has broken it down. And so, you know, you have students who are being discovered from across the world. <coughs> and uh, these universities are very happy to attract them. So, so, so si the simple point is that I think this idea that 
that's the point that I was mentioning, location constrained education, that to get good education you have to be here, is no longer valid. And so therefore that question, when will you see foreign universities entering India, I think it's a moot question. They're already here, virtually or otherwise, they're offering the same degrees. Now the only difference that you might see, you see the, the, the flip point, flipping point would be when corporates will also begin to recognize that. And that's already happening. In fact, one last point I want to make. Yeah. In fact, if you look at it, you find the traditional idea of the degree, education itself has gone away. People are talking about nano degrees, micro degrees, and so on. They're basically saying, develop a skill set. You know, your degree is not what we're looking at. Empl you know, employability is the question Employ that came up here. Employability right? is the challenge. Okay, so uh, the last question, uh, we are uh, short on time, and uh, this is for Shekhaji. We started uh, with you, and uh, we we'll end with you. <laughs> okay, throw some light on RTE as Rotarians. How could we assist, you know, this program? and how effective you know it is so do two things first is read about the act it, uh, itself uh, if you want to just go <clears throat> to the bullet points go to the website yeah. uh, the rotary teach website gives the bullet points that are from the rt you may not want to read the entire act so you can do that and second is register as a volunteer on the rotary teach uh, uh, <laughs> website uh, what you can do, you can only do when you go to the school. Uh, sitting at home, it's not really possible to help out those students. Uh, you want to be a teacher at the Asha Kiran centers, please come. You are a dance teacher, go teach these children how to dance, how to paint, how to speak well. Uh, you could go to the nearby government school, uh, discuss it with the education officer here, and your special skills they can be used not as paid volunteers, unpaid volunteers on, a, on special skills. You may be an excellent maths teacher. If you can speak to the government uh, department here and they agree to it, they will if you go and make a proper presentation. Uh, they'll agree you will be able to go and do that. If you are an expert at how to assimilate people about challenge children for inclusive uh, education, please volunteer yourself for everything if you want to be a part of it, you'll have to volunteer yourself. Okay, so we are uh, uh, totally out of time. Uh, Madan, yeah. Just a minute. Uh, and I, I, I think especially about what Rotarians can do, and here is something that I just wanted to leave the thought here. I think it goes back to what Al Albert Einstein said famously, that I never let my college interfere with my education. I think a lot <laughs> of learning, well, it happens in classrooms and with teachers. A lot of it happens outside the classrooms, right? right? right. How can each of us, especially as, as Rotarians, play a role in nurturing a child through the, through the exploratory journeys, right? What is it that when, you know, for example, my most transformative moment was, I happened to be sitting in 96 next to Dr. Raja Ramana, and he just turned around and said, what are you doing? I blabbered something, he said, come to my office tomorrow, and that one hour I spent changed my life with him. He, he did not have any, he did not, need not have to have uh, done that, but that one hour that I spent with them changed my perspective on, on learning and stuff like that. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity as a rotary network where each of us, if we were to be uh, oriented towards how do you develop a, a, a young adult, how do you develop a kid into a young adult who can become the change maker? It's not about math science, it's about being a better human being. I think there's okay. a huge opportunity for each of us to play. Yeah. Just, just yeah. 10 seconds, only 10 seconds. 10 you know, seconds, because you okay. said a fantastic quote, I want to quote, Emerson, who said, education is not filling a pail, yeah. but it's lighting a fire. And I think to light a fire, anybody can do that. And then if all of us light a fire, it becomes a blaze. Wonderful uh, quote to end uh, this session. Uh, I, have a, I have a lot of questions uh, with me, which is uh, written, I mean, which is your questions. Uh, everybody is going to be around till about 6.30 or 7. We're going to have high tea later, and you can approach... Uh, the speaker to whom you wanted to ask a question. Please ask them the questions and they will be able to answer. And in the meantime, uh, we would like to close this session so that the next sessions can continue. Thank you, Shekharji. Thank you, Madam.